Iceland. It's a tiny country, an island thousands of miles from here. It's between our continent and the continent of Europe, located in the North Atlantic Ocean. The northern tip of Iceland just brushes the Arctic Circle. But Iceland is a nation of fiery volcanic mountains and warm-hearted highly literate, well-educated people. Reykjavik, the capital, is a city of clean air. No chimneys are seen atop these thermally heated structures in that faraway city. Good evening. My name is Dick Clark, your host for a series of programs entitled the history and social structure of Point Roberts. We know the year of the arrival of the first white permanent settler in Point Roberts. We even know his name. His name was John Harris. We know where he was born, Texas. And he moved to Point Roberts in the year 1873. And then exactly 20 years later, the first Icelander arrived permanently to settle at Point Roberts, Washington. And then shortly thereafter, a whole community of Icelandic people arrived at Point Roberts. Today, I am pleased to introduce to you my guest, Runa Thorderson who will be featured in today's program, which is entitled Icelandic Settlement Then and Now. We're very happy to have you with us today, uh, Runa. We're located right here in, uh, by your place, and I see the beautiful flowers in the back, uh, which I understand are your own. And uh, it's a, a delight to be here today with you. And uh, while we're still talking about Iceland, uh, I understand that Iceland has a new president. Can you tell me something about that? I can tell you her name, if I can pronounce it, Vigdís Finnbogadóttir. In Iceland, you know, uh, the women all keep their maiden names. So uh, she was the daughter of Finnboy, but they don't take their husband's names. And it seems to be kind of a trend for retired actresses, which she is, and actors to become candidates for president. So she was elected. This is quite unique, isn't it, Runa, to have a uh, woman president? Yes, it is. And it's the first uh, republic in the world that has elected a woman president. I think I saw her picture, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, just a few days ago. And she's only been president, you say, a short time? Yeah, she was just inaugurated a short time. She's a very nice looking woman. Fine and dandy. We're located in the vicinity of Ben's store. It's just a few feet from here, and Ben's store is really uh, an historic landmark here. And I understand that this store was built by your husband. Is that correct? Yes, it was, 1929. And uh, it's had many different owners since, but he was the one that built it. So Ben's store, then, is a store with an Icelandic her heritage, correct? That's right. It started that way. Mm -hmm. Now I'd like for us to think back many years ago to Iceland. Let's go back to the end of the last century, getting into the 18. 90s. I'm trying to visualize what it was like in 
Iceland in those years. Can you tell me something of the setting uh, when your parents left? Your parents did come over from Iceland. And uh, uh, what was it like? Was it a rigorous, hard living in those years? Yes, it was, and Iceland was having a very depressed time at that time. This was 1887. And so, uh, like Point Roberts, it's too small for the younger people to make a, a go of it, so they moved away. And at this time, there were hundreds of people that gathered at Reykjavik and left on a ship in 18, uh, July 1887 came from all parts of Iceland on horseback to the capital city, got on a ship that was part steamboat and part sailing ship, and uh, not too large, and uh, they headed for Clyde, Scotland. Got into rough weather on the way, and all the women and children got seasick. And before they reached Scotland, the engines conked out. And so uh, that was a very serious thing because if they were late for the, the ship that went across the Atlantic, they would have to stay for two weeks in Scotland, which was not very, very good for them. But they did make it to uh, Clyde, and that's where they landed. Took a train from there to Glasgow. And uh, from there on to... Uh, to up the St. Lawrence River to Quebec on a big steamer. And several things happened on the way. There was a baby born on the ship between Iceland and Clyde. And two children died on the way to over the Atlantic and were buried at sea. And, uh, and then they went from Quebec to Ottawa and there they divided the group. Some wanted to go different places. In, in Canada, they had a um, piece of property sort of waiting for them, which was called New Iceland. And uh, many of them went there. And some went south, some went to Winnipeg, and a few out to the west coast. So really then, there were Icelandic peoples scattered across the uh, nation uh, when they departed from the St. Lawrence area there. Is, is that not correct? Yes, that's correct. And uh, even before this group came, there were other groups. And also there was a group of uh, people that moved to Brazil uh, long before this. And uh, another group that came to the United States and settled with the Mormons in Utah. So this was not the first group. It's very interesting to think that the Icelandic people would have gone all the way to Brazil, so that uh, really they spread out uh, more than I think a lot of people realize. And uh, you also mentioned that they uh, became affiliated with Utah uh, and with the Mormon community there. And so they really did uh, go out quite a ways. Now, I understand that quite a, a group of people also came over to Victoria. Yes, well, the group that uh, my mother and father were uh, the only two out of this group that came straight through to Victoria. But later, a lot of Icelanders came to Victoria, hearing about the good climate and, and quite a lot of employment at that time. And so they had quite a community of Icelanders in Victoria. They had their own little church and uh, uh, services in that. Tell me, who were the first families, the first families, the very first family to arise, arrive at, uh, at uh, Point Roberts? I have heard various reports. Uh, I have my own idea of who the first family is, and I just want to match notes with you, Runa. Well, a year before my people came, there were people from Bellingham, <coughs> the Burns family and the Benson family, and two other families that didn't stay, but just a short time. But the Burnses and the Bensons, they made their homes here. And it was Mr. Benson that went to Victoria and told the uh, Icelanders in Victoria about what a nice place Point Roberts was. 
and that there was a salmon cannery being built which would give employment to people. Victoria was having a real depression in 1893, so they had to look for work someplace else. So they came over to see what it looked like over here, and they liked it, and so they stayed. That was the beginning of it. I see. I have a map showing where all the people in 1904 were living at Point Roberts, and I noticed that the Bensons were located, I would say, right close to the center of, of the Point Roberts uh, land area. Does that seem correct to you? Yes, I think it is about the center. That wouldn't be very far from here, would it, Runa? No, not very far. It's about where the Gulf Air mobile homes are and uh, the um, golf driving range. That was the Benson property. And there's a really a very nice uh, photo uh, of the Benson house. I thought it was so good that I've included in the book which I have just written about Point Roberts. And I noticed that uh, in place of the siding going horizontally, it went perpendicularly. And is that, is that due to uh, Icelandic custom? I don't think so. It's, I think it's more because it was mostly rough lumber, and so they, uh, they covered the cracks with smaller boards. Our first schoolhouse was built that way, too. I see. Would that house have been built uh, of cedar, do you know? I don't know. I'm ju just wondering, uh, it, it seems to me that maybe cedar would have been a, a good material to use, and uh, there might have been a lot more cedar out here in those days. There was lots of cedar, but uh, most of the lumber that they got, but they came, came from Ladner. There were mills in Ladner. Oh, I see. So they brought it down from Ladner? Yes. But the, the, the squatters' homes, majority of the homes were built in logs. They were log cabins. Not this kind of wood, not this kind of lumber. I see. Runa, I have another map of Point Roberts which shows where the Icelandic people tended to locate. And uh, this was in 1904. I drew this map up using the Ellet Report, uh, the report of Ed C. Ellet, who was working for the Department of the Interior in 1904 and who recommended that Point Roberts be opened. Uh, for settlement, and by the way, it was a successful recommendation. It was open for settlement in, in 1908, but I noticed that, that the Icelandic people tended to live in the center parts of the community more than the uh, rest of the people, and the rest of the people tended to live around the perimeter, that is to say, uh, along the shore property, with the exception of the south uh, easterly part where I noticed there were properties uh, by the Myrdals that went down to the shoreline. So most of those settlements were, were on the interior parts of the, of, of the point, of point Roberts. Uh, and I'm wondering, is there any reason why the Icelandic people would settle in those interior regions of Point Roberts rather than along the shoreline? I really don't know, unless it was that the, the, the land was available there or squatters' rights were available there, squatters' cabins and, and maybe a clearing. I don't know. Uh, what about the uh, farming potential of some of that land? Was some of the better land uh, in the interior parts, would you say, for farming purposes? Yes, there were, about the center of the, of the place. The lowlands, of course, where the marina is now, were flooded every winter, so that wasn't a very good farming area at that time. And the, uh, the highlands over toward Boundary Bay weren't considered very good farming land because it was so gravelly and sandy. So, and of course, covered with big timber. I noticed that when uh, Ed Ellett evaluated the farms, that the evaluations for the Icelandic farms were higher than those of the non-Icelandic farms. It appeared that the Icelandic people put a greater effort into their, into their farms. They're, they seemed to construct uh, uh, better buildings. Their, their property valuations were better than the non-Icelandic uh, farms. I think that's interesting. Is there any uh, reason uh, why uh, this would be so? 
Well, we've been called stubborn Icelanders. Maybe that was one reason. <laughs> but they all hoped that they would sometimes get the place to be a, uh, to homestead the place. And so they kept clearing and adding a little more, a few more cows and a little more hay. And in the summertime, they worked for the cannery. And uh, that's, that's why they kept working, clearing. And you mentioned uh, that they worked uh, it, with the canneries. Uh, uh, to what extent uh, were the Icelanders involved uh, with, say, the fish traps? Well, they worked with the fish traps. They worked on the boats. They worked at putting out the traps in the spring, sometimes starting in March, and worked until October when everything was put away for the winter. I see. I uh, have put a photograph in my book, uh, which uh, I, I believe is in your collection, uh, showing, I believe, your husband, uh, Ben, if I remember correctly, I think he was standing off to the right in, in this picture. And uh, uh, then there was another, an, uh, some, more, some more men uh, uh, in this picture. Uh, uh, was one man by the name of, was it Dahl? Louis Dahl, yes. <coughs> Louis Dahl was at that time captain, or uh, uh, foreman of the lifting gang, the ones that lifted the fish from the traps. And uh, Ben, my husband, was the captain on the Penguin, the boat that was taking care of the, the lifting process. And the scow that they had there, you could see on the picture, full of fish. I see. Uh, you know, there must have been some hard times for the people from Iceland. Sometimes, you know, it gets very stormy off Point Roberts. And I have seen some excellent pictures of storm scenes around Point Roberts. And of course, now that we have a new, new marina, thanks to Ed uh, Trossolini, uh, boats may safely come in there and harbor. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I was in the marina just last night talking to a very nice young, young couple. And similarly, there must have been stormy periods in the history of Icelandic settlement at Point Rob Roberts. After all, it's a long way to travel uh, to a foreign, foreign country. Uh, how did your parents survive? Well, uh, if you're talking about storms on the sea, there were very few people that had boats. And what boats they had, they hauled them up before the winter storms. But uh, my parents got along real well with all the rest of the people, and everybody's sort of grouped together for socials and entertainments. And there was a real sense of working together then, I assume. Yes, there was. Yes. And of course, there were, they were other people besides Icelanders on Point Roberts at that time. There were about four families of, of Danish people over on the Boundary Bay side. <coughs> And on the west side of Point Roberts, uh, three or four families of German people that worked for the Georgian Barker Cannery when the Georgian Barker Cannery was built on the west side. And then, of course, others, mixtures of all nations. We even had a black man and a Chinaman. I see. <laughs> I see. That's right. Point Roberts was kind of a tiny United Nations in one sense of the word. And when you think of the Indian heritage that was here, to add to that, it makes it quite interesting. Uh, these little little groups who have uh, come from uh, various parts of, uh, of, of Europe, especially. Uh, I understand that Icelandic people, right to this day, in Iceland, as well as here, have been interested in books. Yes, they have been very interested. And uh, they hadn't been here very long when they formed their own library group. See, it was everybody wanted to read, but it was very expensive to get books all the way from Iceland. And so they pooled their resources and ordered books and had a library in one of the homes. So that worked out real well. 
they subscribed for the Icelandic paper from Winnipeg and, and uh, kept up with the news from the old country. Oh, I'd forgotten about the Winnipeg newspaper. What was the name of that paper, uh, Runa? Well, they had two. One was Heimskringla and one was Logberg. But now the two have combined, and so it's called Logberg Heimskringla. And it's still being published in, in uh, Winnipeg, but part of it is in English. But uh, the uh, descendants of Icelanders, they like to read it and keep up with the, what happens in Iceland. And the name of your group uh, here at Point Roberts, the group that met and the group that shared uh, uh, books? Well, they called themselves Hafstjadnum, which means ocean star. And uh, some of the descendants of Icelanders that uh, started the little newspaper called their paper the ocean star. I don't know why they picked that name, but it was a nice name for the paper, and it's still called ocean star. I agree. I think it's a... Uh uh, a beautiful name for a, a newspaper, and uh, it's interesting to think that uh, to this very day uh, we have a remembrance of the Ocean Star group as we look at the newspaper, the, the Ocean Star, which was uh, uh, founded uh, uh, not very long ago uh, right here at uh, uh, Point Roberts. and. Uh, there's been uh, Icelandic participation uh, all along. And I noticed, Runa, that in just the last issue of the Ocean Star, there was a fascinating uh, short story about a poem that was written in uh, Icelandic. And... Uh, I I believe that this poem was discovered when a building was being dismantled. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Well, many Icelanders wrote poetry, and uh, of course some of it wasn't published, but some of it was. And evidently, this was in a letter, and the letter was found in the attic of this old house that was being torn down, and uh, somebody translated it. I read the poem myself. I think it's a, a beautiful poem. Uh, tell me something about the development of other institutions, such as uh, the institution of religion at Point Roberts. Well, most Icelanders are Lutherans. And about 1913, they decided to form a congregation. And. Uh, uh, pastor from the uh, Icelandic Senate in Winnipeg came out and started a congregation on Point Roberts and also in Blaine, and I believe in Seattle and Vancouver, too. And up to this day, they're still going, but they're not Icelandic anymore. The one in Seattle is, uh, is completely English, the one in Vancouver also. And at Point Roberts, we, all, we always had uh, Icelandic services, first in the Grange Hall and then in the schoolhouse until they decided to build a church. And they raised money to build a church in 1921. And the little church is still there. It's not completely Lutheran anymore, and it's not Icelandic anymore, but we have services during the summers, every Sunday, and occasionally during the winter. You've seen a lot of change uh, in that little church. And uh, we've covered a lot of uh, subjects today. And I'm so pleased to have you with us today, Runa. And uh, it's, it's been a great joy. And uh, it's just getting around that time now for me to close off. This is Dick Clark. Uh, if I can just get this microphone to cooperate. This is Dick Clark from Blaine, Washington. Uh, if you have any questions you'd like to ask about Point Roberts, Washington, just write to me, Dick Clark, Box R, Blaine, Washington, 9823. And then until next time, this is uh, Runa, Thorderson, and Dick Clark saying goodbye. Hi, I'm Michael Jackson with a special invitation to join me on the Michael Jackson program Thursday nights at 10.30 p.m. 
We have a lot of fun and we talk to a variety of people you've probably heard of, read of, or have seen. And I take you behind the scenes to get a close-up look at these various interesting personalities. So please join me in the Michael Jackson program Thursday nights at 10.30 p.m. My name is Dick Clark. Welcome to a series of programs entitled The History and Social Structure of Point Roberts. Today we will begin a study of the institutions at Point Roberts. And our theme for today will be the family as an institution. Today, a bright and beautiful afternoon at Point Roberts, I find myself located at the home of Mr. and Mrs. Fred DeHaan. We're just a little south of the APA Road, uh, just a little uh, east of the middle of Point Roberts. And when we consider the study of institutions, it is good for us to try to understand just what we mean by an institution. Let's look at it this way. Society is composed of institutions that are all related to one another. Society could not really survive without institutions. I can think of several major institutions of which society is made, made up. One of the most important is the family, which is our interest today. But there are other institutions too. There's religion as an institution, there's education, there is the economy, there is government. All of these are institutions that are interrelated. Let's consider for a moment now the family. In 1904, when Ed C. Ellett surveyed the population of Point Roberts, he discovered that there were 45 families then living at Point Roberts. Now, Ellett did not include in his survey the little town of Point Roberts. He discovered among the rest of the population, however, that the average size of each family was 4.1 persons. Now, that was 76 years ago. Today, based upon a recent survey by Jim Arthur, we have discovered that the family size is almost cut in half. Jim Arthur's data reveals that the size of the family at Point Roberts averages out at only 2.3 persons per family. So the families are becoming smaller, but that's not a phenomenon that's just limited to Point Roberts. In our society today, we find a trend toward families becoming smaller. Point Roberts has a population of 422 people today. In 1904, there were 186 people living here. So while the population of Point Roberts is getting larger, the size of the families is becoming smaller. Let's consider for a moment now the age of the families at Point Roberts. We discover that 
20% of the population at Point Roberts, Washington, is aged 65 years or older. So there is definitely a trend toward retirement families coming into Point Roberts, Washington. So many of the children of the families who live here have moved away, and older people have moved in. The average age of the people at Point Roberts is greater than that at mainland USA. And now, for my first guest, I am very pleased to introduce to you today Pauline DeHaan, who lives right here at this beautiful home. And I'm so pleased to have you with us today, Pauline. It's uh, another gorgeous day at Point Roberts, and we've just been having wonderful weather. And some of the questions that I'd like to ask you today are really crucial questions, I believe, for the family at Point Roberts. Mm -hmm. And one of the questions I'd like to ask you, uh, Pauline, is uh, uh, what do you do just for food? <laughs> I mean, the basic needs of life, such as food and clothing, when you're living in a community which is so far removed from the USA mainland. Well, that means a uh, trip to Bellingham at least once a month, sometimes more, for uh, a large stock in groceries. Uh, plus, we have a local store. Uh, and we also have the opportunity to shop in Canada for short trips. And, uh, but mainly, a lot of the people go to Bellingham and stock up because the grocery prices are a bit cheaper over there. But we're certainly free to shop in Canada. Well, let's imagine now a situation in which there's a, an illness in the family and uh, you need the doctor. Suppose, for example, that someone needed hospitalization. What then? Well, in my family, it would be um, we would have hospitalization in Canada because our doctor's in Canada. Uh, some of the retired people have their doctors in Bellingham and are hospitalized in Bellingham. Uh, for us, however, it means paying uh, you know, a large chunk for the uh, hospitalization. But that's just one of the things we have to live with. We would pay that if we went to the U.S. also. I understand. Another subject, uh, Pauline, that is uh, really of interest, and uh, I think it's a bro growing concern at Point Roberts, is uh, the uh, matter of the schooling of uh, the children, of the families here. Uh, what seems to be the trend uh, with regard to the uh, education of the young people? And here it comes a member of the family right now. That's Jason, isn't it? And he's having a great time. Uh, with regard to schooling, what's the trend been lately? Uh, lately, the trend has been a lot of newcomers. Um, when I went to school, I started out at grade school here at Point Roberts, a little one-room schoolhouse. And then I went to Blaine from the sixth grade through 12. And we had about 30 kids on the bus at that time. And it didn't seem to change. There weren't very many newcomers. Um, we'd, as people graduated, students, um, little brothers and sisters would come along and replenish the student supply. Uh, now, however, there's about 60 kids on the bus. That's uh, from kindergarten through grade 12. And uh, there are a lot of newcomers each year. Uh, you say there are about 60 on the bus now. And was it 1963, the last time that a school was functioning at Point Roberts? Uh, was that what you said? I My mind just slips me just now. I didn't say that, but you're oh. correct. It's 1963. <laughs> it is 1963. Right. And there were about uh, uh, 10 students in 1963? I think about that. Mm -hmm. Well, when you think of 10 students in 1963 and 60 students now, that represents uh, about a 500% increase in uh, the enrollment. So I would say that that school bus is really becoming quite quite crowded, wouldn't you? Yes, at, at times it is, yes. Um, and in 1963, there were other children, grades 6 through 12, going to Blaine. So we'd have to add a few more onto the 10. I'm not sure how many, though. Out of curiosity, how do they go about mm, picking up the students at Point Roberts? Here's this tiny piece of uh, territory, 4.9 square miles in size, 
And uh, do they all have to gather at one point and you just pick them all up as a group then? No, the bus comes around, the bus driver lives here, and he comes around to each house, or as close to each house as he can get. And they are delivered back to the, that stop after school. Do uh, you think that uh, it becomes uh, quite a trying trip by the time the students go all the way to Blaine and then uh, come all the way back and then maybe travel around the point for a while before they get off the bus? Well, it's a long day for them. Uh, perhaps the younger ones sometimes might be awfully tired. Sometimes the older ones are awfully tired, judging by my own uh, children. But they do adjust to it very quickly. And it's not that bad. There are other um, areas, even perhaps in Whatcom County, that have a bus trip just as long. Yes, I think that's a good thing to remember. Uh, tell me, what are some of the good things about being a family at Point Roberts, Washington? Some of the positive things that you notice about living out here? Well, the positive things are it's country living, which uh, suits my lifestyle. I really like it. Um, and it's a small community, so you're integrated into the community very easily. Uh, there's a great friendship between members of all ages, and you pretty well know most of the people on the point, which I find it's uh, very refreshing, especially in this day and age when, um, you know, cities are so huge. Yes. Pauline, I really enjoyed talking to you this morning and uh, learning uh, these things about the family at Point Roberts, and it's been a pleasure to, to, to come here to uh, this beautiful place to, uh, to be with you. And so I want to thank you, and uh, we'll be mo moving on to our next guest. Okay. Thank you very thank much. You, My second guest for this afternoon are Margaret and Doug Wagner. I'm very pleased to welcome you to our program this afternoon. And tell me, uh, Margaret and Doug, uh, how did you discover Point Roberts, and how long have you been living here? We've been living here for about two months now, and we discovered Point Roberts because of a purchase of a boat that we took delivery on it here. It was at the marina. Um, the boat was built in Bellingham, and one of the only spaces available was at Point Roberts, and it was by accident, I guess. That's how we got here. Are you the only people who are now living there this way? Uh, there are a few others. There's about, oh, I'd say four, four other people. I saw the boat last night, and I, I really think it's just a lovely arrangement, and I enjoyed myself so much visiting you. Um, tell me, how does it feel? What kind of feeling does it give you to come into a community that is an American exclave? It's divorced from the United States uh, mainland. What kind of, what kind of uh, feeling does this create? What kind of atmosphere do you see? Well, the people have been really great. Um, it's an older community. Most of the people we know are older, but there are some younger couples here too, and I like the way everybody just sort of pulls together. Um, you get to know everybody real well, and they get to know you, so you have to watch your step. But usually, they've been real helpful for us, helping us get to know people, find jobs, everything. It's been great. You feel the community has really been pulling for you right from the beginning, just since uh, two months, uh, correct? I would say so, definitely. Most helpful in, in landing us areas to work here, uh, socially, people inviting us over, wanting to know what brought us here, what we're doing, what do we want to do. Yes, uh-huh. And speaking of coming to Point Roberts, so many people in the past have said, uh, oh, it's difficult to find work at Point Roberts and uh, opportunities are limited at Point Roberts. We've heard this for quite a while. What's your experience right now in terms of jobs, opportunities, that sort of thing? Well, for me, um, I'm a, from, we're both from California, and though we took a, a cut in pay to move up here, um, we really wanted to do something different, do something different than we had in, in California. We both like to sail. This is a great area to sail. Uh, the job opportunities are there. You just have to be a kind, the kind of person who will, is willing to work, I think. 
Yes. Uh, and uh, your experience uh, also? I, I found the people most helpful. I realized at first that nobody knows you're willing to work. So we went out, let them know that we, that we were young, were able, wanted to work. What other jo whatever jobs were available, we said that we could do them. And I think that Doug and I have done very well. It's, you know, coming here, it, it's worked out very well for us to get jobs, to um, just establish ourselves here in, in jobs. Yes, I noticed that the Ocean Star has a picture of you, and uh, you're uh, with the, the Chamber of Commerce right now. Right, yes, right. As a Secretary for Chamber of Commerce. Yes. And so you have really, uh, I would say, become a part of the community quite quickly, even though you've only been here uh, two months, you two say. Months, right. And it's really interesting to know that the marina was created and the marina is drawing young people to Point Robert. <laughs> right. And I'm not sure that everyone realizes that. And I think it's a, a, a an interesting new chapter in the history of Point Roberts, Washington. It must be. <laughs> yes. Uh, what features of Point Roberts do you find appealing? Well, like Doug had said earlier, we do a lot of sailing and this seems to be a, a very nice central location for us to to sail. The islands are available. We could go to the Gulf Islands, down to um, the San Juan Islands, go up to Vancouver, which is something else we like. We like to be able to have the proximity of a, of a larger city so that if we feel like seeing a play or going to the theater, it's there and it's available for us. But we're still um, living aboard the boat and it's very quiet and nice. Yes. Uh, any uh particular interests that uh, she has not covered that you find, Doug? Well, one of her interests is horseback riding, and Point Roberts is a great area for horseback riding. It's so rural, it's sort of, to me, it reminds me of maybe what England would be, or, you know, there's all kinds of trails and things to cover. I like to uh, scuba dive and fish, and I want to find more time for that as we get more free time. Right now we're working quite a bit. So really this gives you quite a broad range of opportunities and when you think of uh, all the possibilities from boating to horseback riding to skiing sure. uh, plus all the cultural events that aren't really very far away when you consider you only have to go to Vancouver which is a short distance away yeah. and so there are a lot of advantages in for a young couple living in Point Roberts. Then finally, there's one more question I would like to ask you, and that is, what kinds of interests, as a young couple just arriving here, what kinds of interests do you believe you can develop here at Point Roberts? Well, that's a pretty good question. Um, I think mainly we both grew up in Northern California, we were very tied to our families there. Uh, we had a lot of security with our families. There's a lot of independence here for us. Uh, it's a complete break away from them. Not that we don't love them. We want to be with them again, and maybe in a few years we will, but right now we're doing something on our own. And that's certainly of interest, that kind of opportunity. I think that uh, Point Roberts then really holds a lot of appeal, not only for people who are retired, people that is 65 years in age, of age and over, but for young people. I'm certainly getting that pi picture talking with you, and I'm very happy to have you with us today, and thank you very much. Earlier today in our program, we discussed society as a collection of institutions. Examples of institutions we noted were such things as government, the economy, religion, and most important today, the family. But society is not just a collection of interrelated institutions. Society is also the holder of culture. And by culture, I mean the values of a people, their beliefs, their 
art, their music, all of these together are the components of culture. And no society exists apart from its culture. Today I'm happy to welcome as my next guest, Chris Manning, who lives right here at Point Roberts and is also a homemaker at Point Roberts. And Chris, I've been talking about society in terms of culture. And it's a very important part of the family. What kinds of opportunities do you see for families at Point Roberts for developing culture, say such as uh, developing an interest in music, perhaps playing uh, the piano, let's say? Well, of course, they go to school and they have a wonderful music program at the school. And for individual lessons or anything like that, if there isn't a teacher available on the point, they can always go across the line to Tuwasan or there are uh, people available in Blaine. Yes, and do you find that around Point Roberts that there are uh, a number of families that are able to uh, develop cultural activities in this way then? I would say yes, there are. There are several families that have a, quite a musical background. Mm -hmm. So that Vancouver then really offers a, a, a wide opportunity then for people and you really don't have far to go. I've, you, know, you know one question I've never asked while interviewing people on Point Roberts is, how far do you have to go to Vancouver from here? How far? Yeah, in terms of miles? Uh, miles, I'm not sure, but it's about a half an hour's drive. Yeah, it's not very far. You just go under the tunnel, don't you? And it's, uh, it's the, the Dees Tunnel has certainly made it uh, within easy reach. Uh, another question I'd like to discuss uh, today with you, Chris, is, is this one. Family ties with a community are important, not only for maintaining the community, but it's good for the families. What kinds of family ties are there uh, in, the, in the community in terms of, of uh, opportunities for them uh, to develop these ties? How are family ties with the community maintained? Can you give me some description? Well, I would say that your holidays are a major factor, Thanksgiving, Christmas, and all those. And then there is the Point Roberts reunion, which will be held Saturday night, which brings back a lot of people that were born here or have lived here in the past and enjoy coming back and seeing old friends and meeting again. And then there's our Fourth of July celebration, which we feel is very special and which we really enjoy putting on. And uh, people seem to really enjoy coming back for that. And then there's the church. Uh, the Grange, and, uh, oh, I can't even think of anything more right now. <laughs> but those are pretty important uh, examples right there. I know that the Grange, which you just mentioned just a moment ago, has been here for quite some time at Point Roberts. As, uh, it's a very important institution at Point Roberts, and I imagine that the families have really... Uh, been brought together through the Grange. Uh, would you say that the Grange ties are just as strong as ever, or would? No, not as they once were because of the society, the way, you know, society growing up, so to say. Mm -hmm. But uh, the Grange did celebrate its 50th anniversary just this past, a year ago in October. And uh, it's, it's been a very uh, substantial part of the point for years and years. When you say 50 years, that's really quite a, a long time. Uh, I've been really del delighted to be with you today. Uh, Chris, thanks for being with us. And uh, in closing, I would like to say to the viewers that if you have any questions about Point Roberts, why don't you write to me? My name is Dick Clark. Write to Box R, Blaine, Washington, 98230. And now this is Dick Clark and Chris Manning saying goodbye for now. For millions of diabetics, insulin is almost magic. But insulin is just a treatment for diabetes. Only research can find a cure. You can help by supporting the Canadian Diabetes Association.
Good evening. My name is Dick Clark. Welcome to third in a series of programs on the history and social structure of Point Roberts. Last week, you will remember that we were at Maple Beach. We also talked about the Lily Point area, a very famous historic point because there was so much Indian habitation there. Actually, we find that Maple Beach and Lily Point have one thing in common, and that is that those areas hosted the Coast Salish Indian peoples. Now, if you will look at the map, which I am now showing, you will notice that Point Roberts is centrally located in the Puget Sound coastal area that once hosted the Coast Salish Indians. Now, if you look carefully, you'll notice that Point Roberts is almost in the very center of that Coast Salish Indian era area. Uh, the Indians who fished off uh, Point Roberts were Saanich, they were Lummies, they had their own reef net system, and in the year 1895, Old Poland, a Lummi Indian who was then in his 80s, described the Indian fishing technique that was then used. This is what Old Poland said. We fished always on the reef with nets. When I was a young man, and for many years thereafter, we made our nets out of willow bark. We would go up the Nooksack River and cut the young willows and peel off the bark and make our nets with it. We would go over to Point Roberts, and at low tide we would go up on the reef and remove all the boulders and big rocks from the bottom for a space of about 60 feet wide and fix our anchors. And when the tide was ebbing, we would take two canoes out to these places and anchor them on the rocks and let our nets down into these channels from which we had removed the stones. And on the ebb tide, we would catch the sockeye salmon and cure them in our shacks at the point. I have seen 30 or 40 nets spread there at a time. When we fished, we would generally have five Indians in each canoe. The nets were about from 6 to 20 feet wide and from 50 to 60 feet long, with ropes fastened to the lower edge of the net, held up by the Indians in the front end of the canoes. When the run of salmon struck the nets, the Indians in the canoes would gather the edge of the nets over the sides of the canoes. The anchor ropes would then be let out and the canoes pulled sidewise together. And after the salmon taken were thrown into one of the canoes, we would drop the nets and pull back to position again. That is a direct quote from an affidavit which was interpreted by John Elwood in the year 1895 describing Indian fishing techniques. Today, we are located at the beautiful Lighthouse Park uh, area of Point Roberts. And if you look just over my shoulder at the pilings out there, right where you see those pilings was the southern end of the first Point Roberts city, or at least that's what uh, British seamen R.C. Maine called it in uh, the year 1864, but I think he was being just a little facetious when he called that Robert City, because it was hardly a city, a village. Captain George Henry R Richards of the Royal Navy called it Robertstown. But uh, I recently found a surveyor's log, which was written in 1859, when the Department of the Interior was at work measuring out 40 acre, acre sections, which would indicate that the name of the town that was once right out there was called Point Roberts. Just why was this village created? Well, it's related to the gold rush of 1857. People who were hoping to make it big in those years 
came around by the spit out there and uh, uh, would stay uh, overnight perhaps at Semiamo Spit and then uh, on the other hand they might stay overnight right here at, at Robertstown or Point Roberts and then they would be on their way to make it rich and uh, that therefore is how the first town of Point Roberts was founded but a lot of change has taken place since then and I'd like to bring you up to date. And here we are, very near to the site where Robertstown once was. We are at Lighthouse Park, and my first guest for this evening is Chuck Grote, who is the park manager of uh, Lighthouse Park. Glad to uh, have you with us uh, this evening, Chuck. How long has this park been uh, operating? The park itself was developed in 1973, so the actual structures and stuff have been here approximately seven years. Chuck, uh, tell me, uh, what kinds of services and uh, facilities uh, are right here at Lighthouse Park? The park itself is mainly a day-use park. This means it's for picnicking and swimming and sunbathers. We also have a camping area and a boat launching facilities, which uh, are used quite extensively due to the good salmon fishing right off the point here. Do these buildings all have separate functions? I see quite an array over here. Well, we have a restroom and a small restaurant and a gift shop that are actual buildings. Then the rest of the structures are shelters from the wind, which comes from any given direction. And so there's always an area out of the wind where people can picnic regardless of the weather. I see. And uh, is this a part of the park, this uh, rather high structure that I see uh, right uh, directly ahead of us but behind the building yeah this is our viewing tower it's used people like to come and just look around see what the points looks like they can get a good view of this end of the point also uh, when the killer whales come through it's an added attraction you can spot them pretty good from there I see so it's a very good place to get a good view then uh, I understand that there are different kinds of events and uh, that there are special occasions that occur here, especially in the summertime. Uh, what kinds of events do take place here? We have uh, two major events in the summer, the first of which is our 4th of July celebration, and we have a parade that comes in in the early afternoon, and then people picnic and have their dinner here, and then when it gets dark, we have a big fireworks celebration and a lot of people from the area attend that. We usually have between two and 3,000 people attend it. Then the second weekend in August, we have our Arts and Crafts Fair, which this year was the seventh annual one. It's gone on for seven years, and it consists of uh, approximately 50 different artists and five or six food concessions, and they set up their displays and booths along the boardwalk here, which is a 600-foot-long area, and it runs through Saturday and Sunday both, and people can come and just enjoy the different handicrafts and artifacts, or else buy stuff, too. I can see the fireworks all the way to Blaine, by the way. Uh, just thought I'd throw that in. Uh, how does this particular park, which in my opinion is a very attractive uh, area, how does this particular park uh, compare with other county parks in terms of its uh, activity and uh, uh, maybe its su successfulness. Can you give me kind of a comparative statement? Well, this park in itself is used mostly by non-county residents, that is people from Canada since it's so close to the border. And so it gets a lot more use due to the fact that Van the Vancouver area has a lot more people. And for its size, per per square mile or per square acre. This park gets heavier use than most, most any of our other parks. Its total attendance is second only to Silver Lake Park, which exceeds 400 acres. This park is only 20 some acres. On the revenue picture, this park supports about two thirds of its cost, whereas the other parks only support about a third. So it, it operates very well, I think. Chuck, it sounds to me like it's a very busy park in the summer times. Uh, do you work uh, an eight to five job? How does that, uh, how does that work? Uh, the job is more a seasonal job than a uh, eight to five type job. In the summer, you may put in uh, 
hours from daylight till dark, whereas in the wintertime you may not have to do anything at all all day long, and it evens itself out over a year's time. Would you say that uh, the greatest proportion of the visitors here then are from Canada? I gather that that's true. Can you give me some idea of uh, what the proportion of uh, Canadians to Americans might be in a park like this uh, on an American exclave? Well, our uh, figures for attendance this year showed that 88% of our use were visitors from Canada and only 12% were from uh, the rest of the United States or Washington. Also, 2% um, of that 12 were other than Whatcom County residents, so that we do get some visitation throughout the whole state. What do you enjoy most about being a park ranger? Did I throw a curve question at you there? Well, I think I enjoy just being out. I've worked at jobs where I'm behind a desk, and if you can get out in the open and talk to people and get to just plain have fun with them, it's kind of a picnic vacation type atmosphere the whole time you're working. It makes the job go real easy. And uh, since uh, you obviously enjoy this work, I can, I can tell that, what kinds of problems would you encounter as a, as a park manager? Here we are in a little piece of territory that is uh, separated from mainland USA uh, what kinds of problems might you encounter that you might not encounter if you were, say, in a park uh, down in the rest of the mainland somewhere in Whatcom County, let's say? Well, I think one of our major difficulties is the fee system here. We charge fees based on the U.S. dollar, which is not always equal to the Canadian dollar, and there's always an exchange rate to deal with and stuff. This is uh, always changing, and you've got to constantly be calling the bank and be on top of this. Also, the park is a, a popular area. The tremendous use creates problems that wouldn't normally be associated with a park with smaller use. People aren't actually doing harm to the park. It's just it's being overused, and it takes more attention to keep it in good shape. I see. Uh, I can understand why it would be overused uh, at a location as beautiful as this is and being so near to Vancouver, BC, and New Westminster, large populations. Uh, what facilities are used most of all? Would uh, this docking facility be used more than anything else, would you say? When, when the fishing season is good, then our parking area for our boats fills up and we have an overflow lot that we're forced to use. But during Saturdays and Sundays, the picnic areas, I think, has the largest crowd come to it. We can have up, upwards of 1,000 people in one day come to the park and just to picnic and enjoy the sun and the beach. Did you say that there is a, a, a gift shop over there? Uh, I think I see a gift shop. Yeah, we have a, a gift shop which was operated this year by my wife on the weekends and also a small restaurant which we open during the summer season on the weekends only. I see. So those are both open at the same time then, during the summer? Yes, they are. And uh, uh, what kinds of things do they have uh, in, in your gift shop? Well, most of the artifacts in there, articles in there, are craft items that local residents of the point have made and they sell here. We do have, however, some souvenir type items for visitors that are on vacation and want to take souvenirs home, those are available too. I see. So souvenirs are also uh, an interesting item in the gift shop. And as for the restaurant, can you tell me something about it? Well, we have, uh, well, we boast one of the better hamburgers on the point. This do mainly because we use fresh vegetables grown right here locally on lettuce and tomatoes on the hamburgers. And our policy is to serve top quality food, serve the best we can, and we had fun doing it this summer, trying to see the tallest hamburger we could make. <laughs> One final question, and that is, what do you see uh, in the future? Well, right now there's budget cuts happening within the county parks department, so the future isn't going to expand, but we'll probably maintain at this level. Maybe in the distant future there'll be a campground added to the park, a more extensive camping area. Glad to have you with us. Glad to have you.
My second guest today is Carl Julius, a retired merchant who is living right here at Point Roberts, Washington. Off to our right, Carl, I see the cannery, but I understand that the cannery has not always been a place for recreation and uh, uh, entertainment. Uh, I understand it has quite an interesting history. Can you tell me something about the background of that building? Oh, I was living at Point Roberts when the cannery was built. That was approximately 1930, built by a fellow that I knew very well, uh, Archie McMillan. Uh, and uh, he also owned uh, fish traps. That's before 1934. And I remember one day he got 50,000 sockeye out of his trap in one lift, which that's a lot of, and that's the reason that the state outlawed the fish traps. It would have used all the fish up, and there wouldn't have been any today. But it wasn't too good for Mr. McMillan because he had to close his cannery down. There were no fish to, to can then because the seine boats, they all took their fish into Blaine and Bellingham and nobody would drop their fish off at Point Roberts. So actually he closed the place up. Then it was bought by the Iverson brothers and they used, um, used the thing for, uh, for the cannery for uh, canning clams, uh, Japanese, little necks, uh, also brought in abalone. They also, during the dogfish days, during 42, 43, 44, during the war, they took uh, dogfish livers out and shipped them into Seattle to Washington laboratories. And uh, <coughs> after, the, after the clams uh, sort of uh, played out in Canada, he was getting most all the clams from Canada, uh, then Iverson thought he would make a nightclub out of it because it, it wasn't too lucrative the canning business, not even of, of canned clams, which they were uh, at the time shipping many of them to New York as a delicacy, and there was pretty good money, but the volume was not there. So Iverson boys, uh, when they're about 80 years old, uh, went, uh, went, got busy and made a nightclub out of the cannery. And even today they call the upstairs cocktail room the can loft, where they used to have the cans shoving down to can the fish in. And that's about up to date on the cannery. Yeah. Actually, there are several interesting eras there that you have covered, Carl. Yeah. Uh, let's go back Good to day, the yeah. uh, uh, fish canning s uh, stage of operation, which was when it initially opened. Were they just canning sockeye salmon in those days, Carl? Oh, no, no. They canned every kind of fish. Pink salmon, sockeye salmon, chum salmon, spring salmon, coho, the whole thing. Whatever the whatever the fish traps caught or whatever the fishermen brought in and sold to the cannery. I see. Uh, Carl, there's a piece of equipment outside the door of the cannery there. Uh, could you identify that for me? Yes, I can. I, I remember when I was a young kid working in George and Barker Cannery, and I had one just like that, but it was uh, obsolete in about, uh, oh, I'd say 1934. It was obsolete, but they call it the iron chink. They used to have the Chinese clean the, um, clean the entrails out of the fish, cut the head and tail off, and slice them for the, for the canning machine. Uh, this machine was invented by someone in Alaska, I believe, and they call it the iron chink because it took the place of the Chinese that used to do the job with a butcher knife. I see. So it was an early sign of automation, you might say. It was uh, mass production in the early years, and uh, I think that that's quite fascinating. Now, uh, you mentioned the loft that was over the top of the cannery. I'm also interested in that. Uh, what was the name of that again in the background? I'd like a little more detail. Well, that was a big open warehouse. Uh, in the wintertime, nothing there. But in the summer, when they were canning fish, it was stacked to the ceiling with cases of cans. And they'd have two or three people up there uncasing the empty cans and running them down a chute into the canning machines down below. That's why they call it the can loft today. I see. Now, getting up into the era when they were canning clams, were the clams just shipped to local uh, uh, points? Most of the clams, I understand, by talking to the Iverson boys, were shipped to the East Coast, New Jersey, and to New York. They even shipped gallons of clam nectar back to New York. Uh, I uh, understand that they were quite uh, 
good clams, these little necks. I understand they were pretty, and uh, were they not, uh, were they not uh, uh, canned right in the uh, shell? Oh, yes, yes. It's funny you should mention that, but we canned many right in the shell. Didn't bother about steaming them out of the shell or anything. They were canned shell and all. And, of course, those uh, delivered in New York at the high uh, uh, nightclubs, some of the big nightclubs and big restaurants, it was considered a, a very much of a delicacy. Uh, now, there's another very interesting uh, area, I think, that's not very far away from the cannery. And that is, if we look right over here to our left, we see... Uh, a light out there, and uh, what is that presently called? Well, it's called the Point Roberts Light. Uh, years ago, when I was a kid, they called it Point Roberts Lighthouse, but there's no house there anymore. It's all just a steel structure with an uh, electrical uh, controlled uh, light that goes day and night for the, for the uh, protection or for the navigation of the ships that come by Point Roberts itself can be seen uh, all the way over to the Canadian Islands. There's no foghorn here, just the plain light. Point Roberts, it flashes every four seconds and every 12 seconds. And if you're a navigator, you see that, you know you're at Point Roberts when you count the four and 12. I Point see. Roberts light. I see. Uh, when it was a lighthouse years ago, I don't believe there was electricity in the point in those days, was there? Uh, how did they go about... Uh, uh, Point Roberts uh, got the electricity uh, uh, from Canada, but the Puget Sound Power and Light is the ones that control it here. They buy it from Canada, <coughs> and um, the furnace says electricity, but that didn't come in until 1932. I believe it was, maybe 33. But before that, the lighthouse had been here for, another, for 50, 60 years. It was run on carbide lights. And the, and the lady that watched the uh, lighthouse for about 30 years, her name was Sarah Olson. And, and after that, of course, when it became electrical, we had an electrician who was Jeff Martin, who was the watcher of the, of the light itself. But the house, the lighthouse, nobody lived in the lighthouse. All that was was a house to, to house the tanks of, uh, of carbide or carbon, carbon monoxide or whatever it was they used for the, for the lamp. I see. And uh, so uh, it was uh, lit by carbide, and uh, I just find it very hard to imagine what uh, it would be like to, ha like to have that kind of lighting. Would someone have to be in attendance all the time to watch the light? No, 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 they wouldn't. No, they just have to check it once in a while to see if the carbide tanks were full and, and change the tanks. I you, see. Don't, you don't remember that we had carbide lights on automobiles at one time, too. <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> Is that right? I remember that, too. So that it wasn't just limited to uh, lighthouses then? Which is quite a little difference in your age and my age, so <laughs> I was here a long time before you were. Well, this has been a, a very interesting discussion, and there's a lot of history just right in this particular uh, area of Point Roberts, beginning where Robertstown once was, where the... Lighthouse Packing Company was, and then uh, uh, we see all the transitions there from fish to uh, clams and then to tourists who come in. Uh, lots of Canadians uh, particularly come down from the Vancouver area, I understand, e evenings. And then here at this beautiful park and then off to my left, uh, the lovely uh, uh, scenery in back of what was once the old lighthouse. Glad to have you with us, Carl. Thank you very much, Dick. You bet. And this is Dick Clark again. And uh, if you have any questions about Point Roberts, I'm here to answer them for you. My name is Richard E. Clark, Box R, Blaine, Washington, 98 two, three, oh. And if you have any questions or comments that you'd like to make, I would invite you to write to me. Stay tuned for our next uh, showing next week at the same time. Thank you. Self-Delta Newcomers would like to meet you. 
They meet the third Tuesday of each month at St. David's Church, 1115 51st A Street. Also, satellite groups meet for lunch, excursions, and so much more. For more information, phone 943-9407. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is second in a series of programs on the history and social structure of Point Roberts, Washington. Today I am at the south, at the, rather at the northeast uh, corner of Point Roberts, Washington, at the Whalen Farm site. And the whole point was once inhabited by Indian people, and it was called Chiltenham. That was the Indian name of Point Roberts at that particular time. The fact that Point Roberts was a popular uh, settlement for the Indian peoples of this area is uh, illustrated by the many Indian relics which have been found in the middens in this part of Point Roberts, Washington. And I am pleased to have with me today Pat Whalen himself, who is with the Point Roberts Development Company right here at Point Roberts, Washington. And I understand, Point Pat, Pat that uh, these mittens are quite close by. I'm very glad to have you with us today, and I'd Thank you. like for you to uh, just briefly tell us what a midden is. Well, a midden, uh, this originally was the uh, grounds where the Indians from the interior of, of British Columbia and also the coast Indians came here to get their winter food, such as salmon and clams and so on. And a midden is actually uh, what you might call a garbage dump. I mean, it's, it's as they shell the, the, the clams out, but they uh, just threw them in a pile. So this area here, further back, uh, has uh, th at least three middens. There's one that dates back 2,000 years. There's another one a little closer, and then out in the front here. Mm -hmm. This was populated. Uh, I don't know whether, whether the people do they actually live. I think they came here to fish off the reef off Lilia Point and also dig clams out in, the, out in this area for the winter food, for drying fish. And I understand. So actually, right out behind us here, the original inhabitants of the Point Roberts area were getting their food right out there. That's correct, and, yes. And uh, uh, I understand that the middens themselves are quite, uh, quite large. And uh, is the Whalen farm site itself on a midden, the, uh, the home itself, right? Yes, it is. And a good portion of the homes that you see back here are uh, sitting on middens in various areas. I see. Mm -hmm. But there's more than just clamshells in a midden, right? Oh, you found, yes, I think they, well, they did bury their dead in these things, whether they were enemies or <laughs> whatever, right. uh -huh. but they, uh, you find the, in many cases, you'd find the whole skeleton either sitting down and, uh, and you find many relics and this sort of thing. Uh, the beads that they found, uh, Professor Doctor, what was his name that had that dig here back in? Oh, I believe you're talking about uh, Dr. Borden. Dr. Borden, he and, uh, from UBC and, uh, University of Washington, they had a, uh, two years in the late 40s, 48 or 9, they had a joint dig here for two years in a row. I they see. They found many th relics that dated back. Mm -hmm. So it was a joint uh, venture between uh, two groups of, of people then. Right, uh-huh, mm -hmm. true. All right, Pat, there was the Indian era of Point Roberts, and then that era passed. And then there was a new chapter that came to Point Roberts later on. Mm -hmm. It's the chapter that I guess we would call White Settlement. That would be and, so, yes. And uh, when we drove down to uh, see you today, uh, I might note in passing that we came down Roosevelt Way. And uh, why is it called Roosevelt Way, Pat? Well, Teddy Roosevelt, uh, 
this, this was originally a, a military reserve. And uh, a lot of people, including my people, came here in the, the 1890s uh, and settled. They squatted on this land. Uh, but uh, during that, I think 1910, I believe, was thrown over, open to uh, homesteading. But the people were already sitting here anyway. But uh, Teddy Roosevelt was the one that uh, signed the, the document that said this was I see. It uh, was during property. It was yeah. during his administration mm -hmm. then right. that this area was uh, settled, and hence that explains why it's called Roosevelt Way. Exactly. Yeah. Uh -huh. So we uh, have uh, history all the way from Washington D.C. right to Point Roberts, in a sense, don't we? Mm, yes, indeed. Yeah. <laughs> Going on to uh, the early years of white settlement, I understand that your own relatives, your uh, your ancestors, came here quite a long time ago. How far back, Pat? They came here in 1890. Uh, my uh, grandfather was a cousin of uh, the Jordan family of Delta, and they were they were living just across the border, just that land adjacent to the border on the Upper Customs area. Uh, so that was what brought my people from the Dallas, Oregon here. Uh, I see. Mm -hmm. I uh, noticed that most of the settlement really took place uh, oh about 1893. There were a, there was a whole group of Icelandic people came in a community and they were actually in just ahead of them weren't they yes just ahead but not that long uh, I think Arnie Myrtle uh, uh, whose granddaughter you're going to interview in a few minutes uh, he was I think the first Icelandic person that came here from Victoria and he liked it so well he brought she started bringing them in a lot came in a lot mm -hmm. came in from then on you see right uh, tell me what was the occupation of uh, the early Waylands, this would be your grandparents? My grandfather, yes. Yes. Uh, what was their occupation here? Well, he, uh, when they left the Dells, he and my father brought uh, t teams with them, and they worked up the coast on uh, building railways and stuff. He was, a, he was a construction man, contractor type. And uh, then he, uh, they settled here through the Jordan family. Uh, and uh, he worked in Vancouver. Mm -hmm. uh, I think Hudson Bay, he helped build it, the base for Hudson Bay, I believe. But anyway, uh, my father s stayed here to prove up on the property. He was only 15. I see. But then, uh, uh, well, they farmed, just like everybody else here in those days. So farming was an important uh, part of your grandparents' life. I understand Pat, that at one point there was a growing interest in the recreational aspect of this area. I understand that they pioneered in recreation here. Is that correct? Well, yes, really, that's true. Uh, um, my mother and father uh, developed this property here in 19, I think, 13. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was the first, uh, I think this was about the same time as Crescent Beach was developed, somewhere in there. Anyway, they, uh, they did develop all this that's what you see here now. I see. Mm -hmm. Which uh, was a homestead, but I thought they were pretty courageous for that time because, uh, Lord's sake, it's 1912, 13. I'd say that's looking ahead, Pat. Uh, yes, it really was. And as a matter of fact, uh, uh, this, my father put in a water utility here in 19, at that time, to service these various lots. And I understand it was the first water utility in the lower mainland other than in incorporated cities. He, is he was, that right? Yeah, he was quite a goer. Yeah, that's really, uh, yeah. that really is uh, uh -huh. being ahead of the times, I would yes. say. They were really far visioned. Uh, what were some of the early recreational activities? Or maybe they weren't so early. Wasn't there once a skating rink, for example, here? Oh, yes, that was in 1937. Was actually, that your parents uh, or your grandparents? Uh, uh, parents. That was your parents. And myself, yes. Mm -hmm. But actually, the first recreation thing that was here was uh, the Waters uh, family, uh, George Waters and, and uh, brothers, they, uh, they had a store just over here where that little beach house is, and a dance hall. Now, that was the first recreation. Uh, they opened that in about 1914, I think, 15 or something. And then uh, oh, there were various things uh, such as uh, horseback riding and well, what, what go, whatever goes with, with recreation. Horseback riding? Yeah, also. we had... Uh, we had uh, uh, when did the stables and the story. When did that start? Uh, well, uh, that was one of my enterprises. Well, one of your enterprises. When I was about 14, I, I got three or four horses and, uh, and then some more, and we rented horses and that sort of thing. 
did a lot of people come down then from Canada? For well, this spring? was actually, this was the, the playground for the lower, well, Delta New Westminster Vancouver. Uh, it's, it's actually the legal term is Maple, name is Maple Beach, but it's always been known as Boundary Bay. Because mm -hmm. uh, it's such a lovely place to be, I guess. I don't know. Well, anyway, sure. But they came here in, uh, in wagons and uh, buckboards and that sort of mm -hmm. thing from New Westminster. Actually, Joe Jordan had a stage line. They would come down the river from New Westminster uh, into Ladner. And then he had a stage line, the horse and buggy and the, the old horse, you know, the serve the fringe on top stuff. Yes. Uh, and he serviced this area at that time. Is that right? Yeah, sure. He was quite a child. That's really interesting, Pat. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, as time progressed, getting up into more recent times, you've uh, mentioned such things as uh, horseback riding, and I mentioned earlier on the uh, uh, skating. Uh, Let's get up to more recent times. What are some of the most recent developments in the recreational aspect out here at uh, this part of the point? Well, actually, uh, I think the, the recreational area really is the taverns and the, and the, and the cannery, which is a nice uh, mm -hmm. nightclub and that sort of thing. Oh, you're telling me that it's diversified. Oh, that, yes. Uh, the whole uh -huh. point, then, has actually become more recreation uh, conscious so that the picture is that your grandparents pioneered in recreation, but as time progressed, the recreation element really expanded into the whole of Point Roberts, Washington. Exactly, that's what mm -hmm. it is. It's a recreational area, mm -hmm. nothing else. So they started we the thousands ball rolling. of people here at uh, Boundary mm -hmm. Bay during the summer months, as we all know. And they also have thousands of, there's, the traffic here at Point Roberts is, I believe, third across the United States, uh, as far as uh, uh, people entering the United States. Mm -hmm. I think uh, there's uh, Detroit, uh, Douglas and Blaine, mm -hmm. and Point Roberts. We're third in traffic. Is that right? Yes, mm -hmm. so uh, there's a lot of people come here for us to enjoy this beach and enjoy other things that are here, like uh, the west side and so on. So Point Roberts, then, is a community in transition. It's developed from fishing mm -hmm. with the natives, uh, to farming and on to recreation right up to the present time. Pat, I'm glad that you uh, uh, were here today and that I could interview you. And uh, Say, Could I interrupt for a yes, second? Yes, you certainly may. Uh, I'd like to mention a man's name. His name is uh, uh, Billy, uh, uh, Billy Taylor. Oh, yes. Uh, he, uh, he was a, a, a finest kind of a person, uh, an English man. Uh, he lived on, on the Crystal Water Beach area. Mm -hmm. That that farm, I think, that Logie is on was part of that. Crystal Water Beach was part of his land. Anyway, he uh, he wasn't too successful here, but he was very helpful to uh, the early settlers, and I think he had a great deal to do with, uh, or a, a certain amount to do with uh, uh, this becoming a, a homestead area. I see. He worked with. Uh, he was. Uh, he had uh, spattering of law and accounting and so on, and he was helpful to the early pioneers that. Uh, people that uh, didn't speak English and this sort to prove up on their property. He was quite a guy, he really So is. besides doing the legal work then, did he kind of act as an interpreter yes. for the Icelandic people uh -huh. who and were not I familiar with, with English so that he kind of kept a community balance here, you might say? I think he was also helpful to a lot of the people that spoke English as well. I mean, he, you know, they all went to Billy for, uh, for advice. I see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, I... Uh, imagine he played a very important role in those days during this uh, period of transition for the community of Point Roberts. That's correct, yes. Uh, is there anything else that comes to mind that is of historical interest with regard to just this corner of Point Roberts, Pat? Anything that strikes your mind right off? That we're winding it up now. I don't think. I think <laughs> Remember we were talking the other day about uh, the, the, I think the first murder on Point Roberts. Right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, a fella, it, we, we, this friend of mine and I, uh, we choose to think we did this. I, we don't know whether it was or not, but we, we dug up a skeleton over on the Freeland's Beach area when we were kids in high school, in the grade school. And we, it was a white man. It may have very well been, Could have been uh, Harris, it may see. have been very well the first uh, white uh, resident of Point Roberts. That was John Harris who came here in 1873. That may have been the one. We thank you. We're very pleased to have you with us today, uh -huh. uh, 
Pat, thank you very much. And uh, we'll be thank seeing you, you again. You Good. bet. Okay. Bye for now. We're in the area of the Whalen Farm site, and uh, not too far down to the south is the southwest corner of Point Roberts. It's a very important corner. It's called Lily Point. And I'm very pleased to have with me today Lillian Barnes Hines, who comes from Blaine, Washington, and who has the Blaine escrow in, in Blaine. I have known you for quite some time, Lillian. And there's a rich history out at uh, Lily Point. Again, the history of Lily Point is loaded with Indian development. The Indians, we know, uh, Lummi, uh, Saanich, uh, were located at Lily Point, and they were very much into the uh, fishing uh, out there. And I do have some sketches of uh, Indian fishing activities and the way in which they uh, used their reef nets out there at Lily Point. And then later on, we found that Lily Point changed. We discovered that uh, a cannery was soon developed, and uh, I understand that you have done some research with that cannery. The very first cannery was, uh, what was the name of that first cannery? I'm trying to think right now, Lillian. The Wadhams Cannery. Oh, yes. Uh -huh. Yes. yes. Uh, well, Mrs. Brewster owned the property prior to the, Mrs. Waller owned the property prior to Mr. Wadham's leasing it from them. Oh, yes, uh-huh, correct. So that uh, a gentleman of the name of Wadham's was the very first person to build a cannery at uh, Lily Point, I understand, correct? Yes, yes, that's correct. And his original cannery site eventually became the site of the Alaska Packers Cannery, which was uh, considerably enlarged when the Alaska Packers Association purchased the cannery in 1893. I see. Same cannery, Same just cannery. Uh, new hands. I understand that uh, when they purchased uh, that cannery, that the APA also purchased the cannery right across the bay out here at... Uh, at Sammy Ammo, the Drysdale cannery at yes, Sammy Ammo. it was one big purchase in those days uh, by the Alaska Packers Association. That cannery was developed. I understand your uncle, your grandfather... Grandfather. Pronounce his name for me. Arnie Murdahl. Arnie Murdahl came very early during the development of the APA cannery. Uh, yes, grandfather came to Point Roberts from Victoria in 1893, where they had been living. And he and several other people of Icelandic descent decided that they would make Point Roberts their home because of the cannery opening and being ready for employment the following summer. So they came to Point Roberts in the early summer of 1894. I understand that at first he wasn't going to come, that uh, unless there was something that he could do in the way of mechanical work, that he wasn't going to come. And I understand that there was a gentleman by the name of Mr. Benson that assured him that there would be that work for him, right? Yes, Mr. Benson, actually the Benson family were the first Icelanders to come to Point Roberts from Victoria. Very first family. The very first family. They Any idea of the date? No, I'm sorry, Dick. 1893 I, along in there, maybe? Prior to 1893. Yes. Because my grandmother uh, mm -hmm. came from Victoria to Point Roberts prior mm -hmm. to her marriage to my grandfather to teach the Benson daughters how to embroider. I see. And how to sew. And so that's how it started. So that's how it started. They were, they were acquainted with the Benson family. And there was uh, what they call the Panic of 1892 in Victoria. There wasn't any employment. There was a recession. So that's a key. And that was the, the key. reason that the Icelandic people came out this way. Yes, okay. it was. It was the key to the reason the majority of the people who came to Point Roberts were unemployed, uh, who had been working in the building or carpentry trades in Victoria. Mm -hmm. And as you said, Mr. Benson assured grandfather that he would not have to be a farmer, which he did not care to be. Mm -hmm. He was someone who liked to work with his hands. So he was employed initially by the Alaska Packers as a machinist, which was one of his trades. I understand that um, 
the Alaska Packers Association was not strictly limited to the canning of fish. I understand that there were two major components to that cannery. One uh, had to do with the fish traps themselves. Yes, the, the, the cannery, of course, had a great number of fish traps in these waters because they depended upon fish in order to can them, and, and that was their principal method of earning the, the funds for the cannery. However, the fish trap industry was also assisted by the Alaska Packers Cannery because men who individually owned fish traps had to have their nets mended and the piles driven mm -hmm. and maintained. So the Alaska Packers Cannery system also served that function. Yes, and I understand that there were a lot of canneries out there. Now I have a, or, or rather fish traps. Now I have a diagram here of uh, a fish trap, by the way. This is what a fish trap looks like. Uh, it's some uh, 1,500 uh, or more feet uh, from one end to the other. That's called the lead. And you'll notice that uh, this is called the jigger. Well, the fish come right in this corner here and go on right down into the large heart and then into the small heart and then into the pot and into the spiller. And I understand that sometimes during a good run, that spiller could really get heavy. And uh, it was a lot of work to lift them out of there. The number of fish traps, I'll show you this one also, Lillian. There were over 40 fish traps operating, not just off Lily Point, but also going around the southern end and on out even to the west side of Point Roberts, although I only see about uh, one, two, three, four, five uh, traps out on the west side. By far, most of them are located in the region of uh, Lily Point, off Lily Point. And uh, it's interesting to uh, note what Francis E. Herring, who was an early writer, said. Uh, you know? Yes, she, she, she uh, visited the Alaska Packers Cannery at one time and she said, after having viewed the traps, to look at the gulf as we went along, it seemed impossible that any salmon could make its way to the Fraser, so thickly were the traps set. A lot of traps. And as a matter of fact, uh, there were so many traps that eventually the state of Washington decided that something would have to be done about it. They noticed that the runs were being affected. It wasn't just the traps, though, that affected the fishing industry. Uh, there was a tragic uh, rock slide that took place in the uh, area of uh, uh, yep. Hell's Gate. Hell's Gate, the upper Fraser Canyon. At Fraser Canyon. Uh, that must have taken place about 1914. And then uh, there was a lot of foreign fishing taking place off the mouth of the Fraser River. And that was taking a lot of fish. So you might say there were three elements that worked there. Uh, so that by 1934, uh, Washington State decided that something had to be done about this. And so fish traps were finally outlawed. And uh, this really affected Point Roberts. Because wouldn't you say that most of the income of the people at Point Roberts in the days of your grandfather were traceable to the fish trap industry even more than the canning industry, the fish canning industry. Yes, I think probably you're correct in, in assuming that the canning industry, however, uh, provided a great deal of employment, particularly for the women of the community. And it was one of the only areas the women of the community could actually find employment in. And, and the women worked in the, in the canning companies during the summer months, during the canning season, and all of the people, the farmers, uh, and their families would work in the canneries during the summer to augment their other means of livelihood. And also they sold some of their marketable products as farmers to the canneries to provide food for the workers who came there. And uh, was there not also a group of people working, the Chinese? at that time, were they not working at the APA cannery? Yes, they certainly were. I, I can remember my grandfather telling about a Chinese gentleman from Vancouver whom he called a jobber. And the jobber, he would give the jobber the number of 
Chinese laborers he would need for the following season. And then the jobber made arrangements in China for the coolies to come over by boat to be employed by the Alaska Packers Corporation. Very good. We're very glad to have you with us today, Lillian. And we've learned a lot about this whole east side of the Point Roberts community. Thank you. Thank you, Dick. We have been studying Point Roberts, Washington, the history and social structure of a unique community. My name is Dick Clark, and I would like to encourage any of you to write to me and ask me questions about Point Roberts, Washington, or if you have any comments that you'd like to make, I would be happy to receive these as well. My mailing address is Box R. Blaine, Washington, 98230, USA. Hoping that you'll tune in next time as this series of 10 programs continues. This is Dick Clark signing off at Point Roberts, Washington in the Maple Beach area for today. <laughs>
is uh, being discussed quite widely throughout Point Roberts today is the whole question of city status, whether or not Point Roberts should have that status. Do you have some feelings about that question, Eileen? Well, I feel that I don't know too much about it, enough to really get into details about uh, being for or against it. But I do have a lot of questions about how in the world can something like this be financed in such a small community. I've been assured that there's lots of money around, and there's lots of money to do it with. And But I just can't envision where this money would come from and who's going to pay the bills if it does become a city, because it would be so many more things that would be required to become a city than as a farm, farming or rural or bucolic existence that we have now. What views do you have about this question, Carl? Well, I uh, differ slightly in that I don't think that financial feasibility is the, is the main issue. Most of the goods and services that uh, a city would have to provide for the residents of this area are currently being provided from a county level. And in fact, the residents of this area are paying for those services through their tax dollars. Uh, I'm not uh, quite certain that I am totally in favor of incorporation, but I don't think I would rule it out on a, on a financial basis. Do you have a general impression of how the community as a whole feels about the question? Is it, does it seem to be lopsided, or uh, uh, do you have any kind of a general impression about that, Eileen? Well, I've heard arguments pro and con on it, and I feel that there's just about as many people for it as there are against it. It seems to be pretty evenly divided at this time. And there doesn't seem to be any definite line of uh, business people against uh, summer people or Canadians versus Americans or anything like that. It's just mm -hmm. a very individualistic thing. Would you agree, Carl? Yeah, I would say that it's probably as closely a contested issue as I've encountered in this area. There, uh, uh, if and when it uh, arrives at a vote, I think you'll find that uh, one or two votes will make the difference. Let's suppose uh, for the moment that uh, it passed. Let's suppose that it did become a city. Would it then be clear sailing? No, I don't think so. I think that it, a government, uh, the proponents of the proposal uh, uh, tell you that the advantage of having a, an incorporated area is that you have a more responsive uh, government uh, to the needs of the people in the area. However, you have to admit that uh, and realize that a, any government is going to be faced with certain problems and certain difficulties, and uh, uh, it's going to be banned by, uh, you, you know, human people and uh, you're going to encounter the same kind of problems you now have. Uh, you may have fewer, uh, you, may have, uh, you may solve some of them, you may create some new ones. Uh, it's never really clear sailing. We live in a society, you know, that uh, has been conditioned to believe in uh, the concept of progress, and it seems that in our society we often solve problems only to discover that new ones have been created. That does happen from time to time, and I wouldn't say that that's particularly uh, new, would you? No, not at all. And in fact, uh, you almost have to depend on the fact that any kind of uh, change in an environment or a social structure or a governmental structure is going to bring with it uh, not only the improvements but also the attendant uh, difficulties. Yes, which leads me to think of other possible issues, such as uh, law enforcement, for example. Do you have any views about law enforcement in our community, Eileen? Well, I think the people that are here that are doing the job are doing a fantastically good job. Whenever we've called for help, we've had it immediately. But uh, I, can't, I can't see how they can cover as much ground as they need to cover. There needs to be a lot more people here to help with this law enforcement. Um, the marina, for instance, is such a very vulnerable place, and there just needs to be a lot more security in the marina area itself. That, uh, if everybody that was here in the law enforcement capacity spent all their time at the marina, it still would just barely cover it. And I think there needs to be somebody on each corner, so to speak. Uh, it just seems to me like, uh, although, a community of this size, we probably don't have any more near the problems that a community of the size of this size that would have over in uh, the Blaine area or Linden. 
It's just a different kind of problem. Both are border-related communities. I live in Blaine myself. You're suggesting, Eileen, that as community development takes place, uh, law enforcement problems will also tend to accumulate as that development occurs. It seems that as we become more civilized, we need more protection from ourselves. Yes. Do you have any views about this, uh, uh, Carl? Well, I personally uh, feel like uh, I, I have to uh, relate the law enforcement difficulties or the crime difficulties in this area to other areas that I'm familiar with, and I don't find that, uh, I don't feel a, an excessive amount of crime that's going, uh, going on here. I also feel like uh, the people that are currently in charge of our law enforcement, which is the Whatcom County Sheriff's Department, uh, have done uh, uh, an admirable job. Uh, I feel like we have every bit as much uh, protection in this area as uh, is available in any other area of Whatcom County. So based on the manpower and the budget uh, constrictions that uh, that department has, I feel like uh, we've gotten our fair share of, uh, of enforcement. In what ways uh, would law enforcement in uh, Point Roberts be related to uh, people who are working at the border? Well, that uh, the law enforcement people here have told me that uh, the border, the unique border situation that we have, tends to uh, aid their uh, uh, efforts quite a bit uh, from the standpoint, first of all, that uh, you have a method of screening the people that enter the area, uh, and that will result in some perhaps potential uh, problems being avoided. And uh, furthermore, those people, uh, whether they be customs or immigration people, are in fact law enforcement officers themselves, only at a federal level. And uh, they are available for backup, and uh, the local uh, uh, deputies uh, do call on them from time to time, and, uh, and they provide a very important uh, source of uh, assistance to those deputies. Yes. Cons consider some other issues now. We've discussed uh, law enforcement. We've discussed uh, city status prior to that. Where you have people, you have certain needs. And one of those needs is water, which has become another issue at Point Roberts. I'm reminded of the old poem, water, water everywhere, and all the boards did shrink. Water, water everywhere, and not a drop to drink. Well, I think that's an uh, exaggeration of the Point Roberts situation, but I can look out and see water all around me. But what about water right here, Eileen? Well, there are lots and lots of problems with the water. Uh, the taste of it is bad, of course, and the consistency, it gets a little thick sometimes. Uh, I haven't heard of anyone becoming ill from it. Uh, and surely in other areas in the United States, the water is more polluted and more horrible than it is here. But one thing uh, that I was sort of chagrined about this summer, operating our little store, we have an ice making machine. And several times I was asked, is this Point Roberts water that goes into your ice? And I said, well, of course it is. Oh, well, then I don't want to buy it. Well, I, it looked like perfectly good ice to me. And. Uh, then the fact that we have to have uh, rationing in the summertime. Uh, we can't wash our cars and we can't water our gardens on certain days and certain hours. And this seems to me in this day and age to be a bit ridiculous with all the water that there is north of the border, so to speak. Water. <laughs> Good question. <laughs> uh, water has been a problem in Point Roberts area uh, for a number of years in the uh, uh, somewhat less than 20 years ago, a, a uh, specific district was formed to uh, analyze and solve the water problems. Uh, over the period of time that it's been in existence, a number of people have been involved, and uh, all of them have contributed to the solutions, but the long-term solution uh, has not yet been achieved. The long-term solution in many people's minds is an unlimited source of uh, pure uh, mineral-free water. Uh, Eileen pointed out that uh, there is a good source of this in the uh, Vancouver area. That has been uh, uh, 
subject of a lot of discussion and a lot of work from a lot of people to try and affect that uh, uh, arrangement. But the, the fact is that uh, it doesn't appear that we're a great deal closer today than we were 10 years ago to achieving it. Uh, the uh, quality problems that we have with our water is, uh, is something that is contributed to, first of all, by the fact that it's all well water and high in mineral content. And secondly, from the fact that we don't have the number of users of that water uh, that would be uh, required to maintain a good free-flowing system. Uh, the area has been, uh, has had the reputation of uh, having growth thwarted by the lack of water. And uh, in many people's minds, um, the lack of water and sewers uh, will keep this uh, area uh, rural and underdeveloped. Uh, and frankly, in many people's minds, that's very, uh, very desirable. But uh, in fact, I believe that uh, the alternate sources of water uh, will be uh, accomplished. Uh, we will see this area solve its uh, uh, water shortage problems, water quality problems and its sewage uh, problems. And uh, if the area is to remain rural, it will have to do so despite the, the uh, availability of all of these uh, types of services. When I think of water, I think of A, courting Canada, B, bargaining with Blaine, C, digging deeper wells. Isn't that about the limit of the choices? That's about it. Yes. I can't think of anything else. <laughs> Can you, Eileen? <laughs> well, we could, uh, we could uh, dredge out uh, a portion of the uh, uh, sound and uh, build a, uh, a reservoir that would catch all of the rainwater. But uh, since it rains less in Point Roberts than any place in the area, why, that probably isn't a feasible solution either. <laughs> yes, and there's always the possibility of, uh, I don't think I can even pronounce it, uh, where you take the salt out of the water, you desalinize or something, the water. I've heard of that, and I believe that's being done in some uh, countries. Have you ever heard of that technique? Oh, I've heard of it, and I've heard that nothing except bad news about it. It would cost a fortune, I know. Too much money yes. Involved. Medicine. It's been discussed at least since 1904 in Point Roberts when uh, Ed C. Ellett took a survey here and said there are no doctors at Point Roberts, which may or may not explain the health that the people enjoy here. What do you think about medicine? Well, as limited as the land area is, we are not going to have uh, millions and millions of people here in this area. Um, I don't think that the community itself would support a doctor or a dentist, uh, particularly when it's, well, 15 minutes from the time of the accident until the time you can have an x-ray taken in Tawasin. It just doesn't seem logical to me that any kind of a doctor, a practicing physician or dentist would come to the point. The only kind that would maybe be interested would be someone who is on the verge of retiring or is already retired. And I feel if, unless they are completely retired, um, there wouldn't be a viable living for him here. And if there was a viable living here, well, I don't know. It's a very confused issue, I think. Uh, but no community of this size, this population, has a doctor and a dentist of his own anywhere else in the United States that I'm aware of. There may be communities, in fact, where people have to travel farther for services. Well, yes. I lived in Hackensack, Minnesota for many years. And it was 13 miles to the nearest doctor, and this was when well, I was very young and no one thought anything of driving 13 miles to get to a doctor at that point and uh, then but mo most people prefer driving 50 miles to a bigger um, clinic more competent doctors or uh, at least a hospital and uh, I feel that driving five minutes or ten minutes to Tawasin is no hardship on anyone and we have a very competent medical aid uh, group of people here that can get people into the ambulances and get them over there and nothing flat. And I feel that there just is no need for a doctor or a dentist here. Mm. 
How do you maintain the uh, competency of that group? Is there some kind of an ongoing training program for those people here, Eileen? Yes, there is. How do you maintain the uh, competency of that group? Is there some kind of an ongoing training program for those people here, Eileen? Yes, there is. They're trained. Uh, they take training courses every now and then. I'm not a, a member of the group, um, but I know several people who are in the group, and they certainly are some of the most competent people in the area in many ways. And they are very uh, cognizant of what is going on in the medical field and emergency health particularly. That, that is their business, and they do a very good job of it. It's also one way in which a community of this size and location can protect itself and help insure itself against uh, any possible tragedy that might occur. And I'm very glad to hear about this. We probably, in that line, we should probably should mention our fire department, too. They're one of the most competent in any small community that I have ever heard of. Is that right? Fire department. Uh, have you heard about the fire department being pretty good here? <laughs> it's a classic example that volunteers do a better job. I see. That's, uh, that's, that's the only explanation for the quality of service that we have with the fire department and our aid unit, which are uh, essentially operate as one entity. Uh, the the uh, bulk of the people are, uh, are concerned uh, volunteer uh, individuals who, uh, whose uh, devotion or dedication to the to the job uh, gives them a level of excellence that uh, is hard to find in uh, in many areas. I understand that that fire department is not too far away. I don't think we can see it from here, but isn't it just across the road? It's just on the other side of this building, just back of us. Yes. Let's move on to another topic. I'm just not quite sure uh, how much time I have left here, but I think we may have time to talk about county parks for a little while. And that is a topic that I think is of uh, concern here at uh, Point Roberts. Uh, uh, what are some of the late developments? Well, as, uh, as you know, Dick, our, uh, one of the most uh, beautiful spots on the point uh, is at the uh, southwest uh, corner, uh, and it's called Lighthouse Park, which is a park that is part of the Whatcom County Parks uh, District. We've been advised recently that Whatcom County Parks District has uh, received a reduction in their operating budget um, and as a result has uh, been uh, forced to reduce uh, their overhead in the form of uh, cutting back some people. In so doing, they uh, uh, selected the people uh, that, that were going to be cut on the basis of tenure and uh, as luck would have it, the man that was uh, operating the park here locally uh, was one of those people. Uh, beyond that, uh, I haven't uh, heard a great deal about uh, any other uh, changes that uh, the Parks District has in mind. Uh, I haven't heard that they intend to abandon the park or they do not intend to man it or anything of that nature, although there are some, there has definitely been uh, uh, some fears among the local people that that would be uh, the outcome. I, I feel, however, that um, it's only uh, it's only fair on my part to allow the the parks district to uh, attempt to solve the financial difficulty that they have and give them an opportunity to uh, to uh, work out the the manning and the staffing of uh, of this park and the rest of their parks within the constraints of their budget uh, before I. Uh, make a judgment about uh, whether or not they're doing the proper job. Uh, it's uh, a very nice facility, and uh, it provides a, a form of recreation for the residents and the visitors to Point Roberts that I'm sure nobody wants to uh, see gone, uh, including the, the people at the county executive level. So I, I feel a, a certain amount of optimism about the future of the park. Uh, I think it'll continue to operate uh, in the fashion that we've been, become accustomed to. I'm glad to hear you feeling optimistic. I really felt uh, rather sorry to hear what had happened, uh, the cutback in, in finances. Well, uh, we, we all were because we had, uh, as uh, members of the community, we'd gotten to know the man that was uh, uh, in, that we're speaking about and, 
and uh, had become very, uh, he's a very personable young man and, and one that we all uh, enjoyed uh, living and working with. But uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, I have to uh, uh, try to understand what uh, the problems are at the county level in terms of their funding and budgeting. I uh, have an announcement to make at this time. I have just given birth to a book. It's entitled, see if I can find one here, Point Roberts, USA, the history of a Canadian enclave. And uh, it just came out, and I'm trying to uh, recover from the birth of this book. I've never done anything like this before, Eileen. Well, I think it's a splendid book, Dick. And I think everyone should certainly hurry and get a copy of it. And you can get a copy at Ben's store. And you can also get a copy at the Roof House. And probably shortly. Well, you get a copy at the farmhouse, too. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I've, en I've enjoyed writing it. You know, it took me 11 years to do this. It was an outgrowth of my master's thesis. And I'd like to thank you both for appearing with me today, uh, Eileen and, and Carl. I've uh, enjoyed very much uh, talking with you. It's been my pleasure. <laughs> I've, enjoyed it very I've enjoyed it very much, Dick. Good to have you with us. And I would like to suggest to our viewers for everything that you've always wanted to ask about Point Roberts but were afraid to ask, <laughs> just write to Dick Clark, Box R, Blaine, Washington, 98230. And I'll be glad to answer any question that you might have. Perhaps you're someone in school, perhaps you're in college, and you'd like to uh, know more for your lessons, just write. And so for now, this is Dick Clark saying goodbye. If you were a diabetic, you'd be more prone to blindness, gangrene, kidney, and heart disease. You can help research find a cure while aiding our educational efforts. Send a check today to the Canadian Diabetic Association, 1491 Young Street, Toronto, Ontario, or to your local branch. Diabetes must be cured. Welcome to this, our fourth in a series of programs entitled The History and Social Structure of Point Roberts. Today I find myself located just below the APA Road, just about halfway, a little east of halfway, and uh, we are just south of uh, the road, and we are at the uh, farm site of uh, Logie Thorstenson, and I'm very pleased to have a uh, Logie Thorstenson with us today, and we are going to be discussing uh, farming at Point Roberts. When you come to Point Roberts, you immediately think of Point Roberts as a beautiful uh, community in which to find recreation, in which to find uh, entertainment, in which to relax, a place to picnic, a place to enjoy yourself. But this has not always been the history of Point Roberts. Point Roberts was once a very fine farming uh, community. And I'm very pleased to have with us today Logie Thorstenson. Logie, as I look around at this beautiful site, I'm very much impressed with the beauty of it all. I'm, I really think that you were very wise to come to Point Roberts, Washington. It wasn't my choice to come to Point Roberts. I was born here. I couldn't do anything about it. I was born in a log cabin right down over that over that locust tree down there, cabin that was built before my dad came here in 1894. I see, so you have been here for uh, quite a few years then, Logie. 
uh, right here in this uh, part of Point Roberts, uh, Washington. Logie, as I drive around Point Roberts, I notice a lot of barns, and some of these barns are quite impressive. As a matter of fact, uh, I believe it was two days ago, we were driving by a large barn right out by the marina, and uh, I saw people taking pictures of that barn. I think people see this barn as an historic uh, landmark. Uh, could you tell us something about that barn? I'm sure that uh, many of our viewers are familiar with that particular barn. It was built by Henry Julius and uh, about there, 1918, I think. I acquired it in 1956, I believe, when I bought the Julius farm, including the barn, and used it as a cattle hay storage and a cattle feeding barn until I quit farming or stock cattle down at the Thule land. I notice, uh, Logie, that it's a very large barn. Uh, isn't it one of the larger barns at Point Roberts? There never was any real large barns, but I guess it was about the biggest. The largest barn there. Right. Logie, farming has been a very important uh, part of the history of Point Roberts. Uh, about when uh, did uh, farming begin as a way of making a, a living? Uh, about when did uh, this uh, era begin on Point Roberts? Well, I think the first settler that came here started farming, that was John Harris, and by the time he was murdered, which was 1882, he had 30 cattle which were uh, branded, and he had his own registered brand. I believe you tell a story about his murder in the court trial in your book, and that will be an interesting chapter, right? Yes, as a matter of fact, uh, Logie, I have uh, covered uh, the life of uh, John Harris, who was the first uh, white settler at Point Roberts, and I believe that uh, cattle was really one of the main sources of his livelihood. There are a lot of stories told about how he used to uh, patrol his cattle on board. He would be on, on the back of a horse with a gun in his hand. John always took a gun with him wherever he went. He protected his interests, but uh, indeed, uh, I believe that back in the 1880s, perhaps even earlier than that. He came there in 1873. Uh, he had as many as 38 cattle at Point Roberts. So I would say that is a good sign of uh, farming beginnings at Point Roberts, uh, Washington. Uh, what kind, oh uh, yes, uh, someone else. Uh, I think Brewster was the more prominent farmer in the early days. He was uh, one of the earliest settlers here. My dad told me that he used to be a Pony Express rider in California when he was a young fellow. And he came here, I don't know, you know the date better than I do. But anyhow, he uh, diked the part of the tool and drained it. And he had cattle running all through the point through the woods here. And he also had a crop of peas on that sand ridge that between Edwards Drive and, the, and Freeman's Beach. And it must have been a real moist summer like we had this year to be able to grow peas on that sandy ridge but come to think of it it was a moist summer i guess because it was 1894 the year of the big flood on the delta flats over here this is uh, a bit of diversification i see we began by talking about cattle farming but uh, now we learn about uh, pea farming with mr brewster what kinds of farming did take place at Point Roberts over the year? Was it uh, just uh, cattle and peas, or were there uh, other forms of farming before, besides that? Can you tell me something about the kinds of farming that took place over the years, Logie? Well, the early settlers, which were called squatters, because this is a military reserve, oh, yeah. and the ones that had faith in the fact that they would someday own the land began clearing the woods. Like, this was all solid woods, this field. And they gradually they cleared it, and the subsistence farming, they worked at fishing and then in the canneries along with their farming. Like my dad and his partner over here by, bought their first cows over in Birch Bay and walked them around Foundry Bay from, from Birch Bay. 
And they started on a small scale. They raised their own food and had a few cows and chickens and gradually got bigger until, I think, at the height of farming on Point Roberts, the average farm was probably 80 acres or maybe less than that, 40 acres, I would say. And the average herd of dairy cattle was about from eight to 10 cows, maybe three or 400 chickens, skimmed their milk and shipped the sour cream to Bellingham, fed the skim milk to hogs and calves. That is the way of living and they raised their families and everything and done all right. Were there much, uh, was there much problem in shipping that milk? Uh, how did you ship that milk, uh, the dairy produce? Was it shipped uh, by land or by water in those days, Logie? It was shipped by mail boat. Mail and freight boat ran to Bellingham every day. There was the last until they gave that up and started trucking and then it was shipped by truck directly to Bellingham. I see. Logie, uh, they tell me that uh, there was once a potato era at Point Roberts, Washington, and uh, that potatoes was quite a, a big uh, farming industry at one time here. Could you tell us something about that? Well, it wasn't really big, but uh, I guess I had the biggest acreage. I had all this field here in potatoes. And we learned uh, how to do it from our Canadian neighbors. They sprouted their seed and got them in as early as possible. We'd uh, plant our seed as early as February, middle of February, to try to beat the duty that came on the 15th of June. We tried to have most of our crop harvested by then, because they were duty free up till that time. And Ma Vancouver was our best market for those real early ones. We didn't get much, much tonnage in the acre, but we got a good price if they were early enough. I meant to ask you about uh, the potato sacks that you used. Is there one of those on display down at the center by any chance? Yeah, there is. We organized our own uh, Potato Growers Association. Had those sacks made in Seattle by the Bemis Bag Company. And uh, we tried to organize a standard brand to, to ship to Bellingham, but it never worked out very well. It, didn't, it wasn't a success, actually. I see, Logie. Another thing that interests me is uh, the cabbage farming. Uh, I only learned about that uh, just a few days ago, and I was very fascinated to hear about that. Uh, could you tell us something about uh, the cabbage? Well, this, after the early potatoes were taken out, I found out I could uh, get a contract to raise cabbage seeds. That was during the war. So I put in 12 acres of seed here, and that is a very profitable crop. In fact, the only way I made a goal was to uh, try to get the most out of the land with the le with, uh, and concentrate the crop. And, this t and I bought more land. I bought this 20 acres next door. I farmed it for a few years, and I found out that I could get more out of it by subdividing it. So I subdivided it and, and sold lots. And then I bought 110 acres down on the Thule land, and then I rented some more, so I was farming about 250 acres down there and this home place besides. Logie, I think this tells us uh, something about uh, why you survived so long as a farmer here. Weren't you one of the last farmers to uh, finally close out in the farming work here? I guess I was about the, the last one that farmed to any extent. Come to think of it, I think you're still doing it. I saw you up there. Uh, uh, your uh, granddaughter was had a ladder and was up there in the pear tree just a couple of days ago. <laughs> well, I haven't exactly retired. I'm raising, I'm raising feed for those horses. I put up enough hay for them. That little barn there is full of hay for the horses. But actually, I'm retired as far as commercial farming. I'm just an old 83-year-old playboy now. <laughs> <laughs> Farmer, if that sounds better. I just think you do beautifully, Logie. Uh, one uh, final uh, question I'd like to ask, and that is, uh, uh, and I meant to bring this up a little early, earlier, and that is uh, the uh, drainage problems uh, at, at the point. Uh, had that been a problem that hampered the farmers quite a bit? It hampered the farmers on the lowland. Uh, that uh, land down there was all below sea, you see, below sea level, and it had to be diked and drained and a floodgate established. 
But after that was diked and drained, it, it was the best land on Point Roberts. Yes, I understand that uh, it's the land where the Muckleteal peat is, and it's very fine uh, ground indeed. The problem has been in the past uh, one of drainage, and uh, I understand that back in the 1930s, a uh, very innovative uh, technique was used whereby the WPA uh, said that they couldn't uh, just repair the dike alone, but they had to do something else. Can you tell us what? Yeah, it was uh, in the depression in the WPA area. I guess everybody knows about that. And they had no money to spend on dikes, absolutely not, but that you could get an appropriation for roads. So our smart little senator, Edwards, he uh, arranged it so that they'd build a, road, build a dike with a road on top of it, which they did, and we had a beautiful dike out of it, which uh, served the purpose. So they built a road over the dike, and uh, you had both a dike and a road, which I think was great. Logie, it's been a great pleasure to interview you today. We must go on, uh, and uh, I'm going to come up and uh, have a nice long visit with you again before long. Thanks so much for appearing yeah. with us, Logie. Okay, Dick. Bye for now. <laughs> We have now moved to the marina at Point Roberts, Washington. This is an area which was once called the Thule, a low area, a flood-prone area. Before the turn of the century, Arne Murdahl wrote about this area. He said that it was once a natural lagoon in which uh, a sloop some 30 feet long could come in and turn around and go back out again. Today we see it as the beautiful Marina, and I am very pleased to have as my second guest on our program John Behrens, a local investor here at Point Roberts. And uh, my first question, uh, John, is uh, what is a marina really? Is it just a is it just a body of water that has been created by mankind here, or what is it? No, it should not be. It should be in uh, actually a whole village with everything around it and. Uh, uh, all the facilities for the uh, boat people need that uh, when they come in that they can have some uh, recreation around yeah, but not like it is now like it is now it is just not finished see then this was actually the first phase and the second phase should come and that means that there should be built around all kinds of buildings like uh, where we are saying now there should be the harbor master building with in it uh, kind of small stores and uh, a uh, small shopping center and uh, a coffee shop, uh, the office for the for the marina itself, and uh, a community center where the boat people can come and talk together about their uh, experience with the boats and things like that. And then next to that, all the surroundings that we see here that should be built. And there should come, uh, like, uh, uh, first of all, a uh, boat repair and a boat sale business. Then all the people that come in, they might get troubles with their boat, and for that you need a business that can repair them. And that's one of the first things that uh, should be done. You know that the marina is sold now, and it was taken over by a Canadian company from Calgary, Birth Oil. And these people told me that they're going to build right away now, uh, starting the first week of November, and they try to finish uh, some of the buildings already, um, let's say, the end of February. Then the first of April, the season is starting for the voters, so they should have something at that time. I don't know what money these people will spend in the whole development, but uh, you ask me what is what is a marina, and just like I say, the marina should be the heart, actually, of Point Robbers. Then what happened in Point Robbers the last hundred years? Nothing. Okay? And this is actually the first big thing that happened in Point Robbers, and from here out should start the, the, the developing for Point Robbers. In Point Robbers now, at the moment, perhaps you have perhaps 15 or 
20 jobs year round, that's all. And uh, when the marina is built out with all the surroundings, we expect to have about 60, 70 jobs here. And that's what we need for Point Roberts. See, then now, you know, the most boaters here are just uh, are Canadians. Then uh, uh, actually Point Robert is not yet known by the United States people. And that's one of the things that should be done. Build it out and try to get more United States people in, more United States boaters in, and more United States businesses in. We at the moment we have, I think, 80% uh, Canadian boat owners here. And uh, that should be changed, I think, that uh, we should get more Americans in it. You don't think so? Yes, I think, uh, John, it's nice to have a balance in the community, a balance of both groups, uh, a good healthy balance. And uh, if you see a balance coming this way, I think that it's healthy for everyone uh, involved. Another question I wanted to ask you about the marina, before I forget it, John, is uh, what is the berthing in this marina? How many boats can uh, be harbored here? Uh, we have over 1,000 slips, I think 1,030 slips, uh, that's what we have. Uh, that is uh, going from uh, 60 feet to uh, 24 feet. And then in the channel, what you see on that side there, there we have space for uh, a couple of big boats, let's say up to 120 feet. I see, I see. So you have designated areas for the larger boats then? Yeah, yeah, there are special areas where we can move the, the, the larger boat, just like I say, up to 120, perhaps 150 feet. In terms of acreage, how big would this marina be then? Uh, the water surface is about 35 acres. I see. What uh, functions do you see the marina performing in the community of Point Roberts? Now, you've covered a, a, a number of things. Uh, one of the functions I see is uh, in, increase of employment in the, yeah. in the future. But now, looking at the marina itself, obviously, one of the functions is harboring of these craft that are behind us. Yeah. But, but other functions, what, what other functions would it perform? Uh, look at the fisher boat, you see. Uh, now the fisher boat do not have to go back to Blaine or to Bellingham when they have more as one day fishing. They stay the night over here and they like the marina for them. It is a very good uh, moorage. But also when some boats are in trouble outside, now they have a place where they can come in me and uh, shelter when it is uh, rough outside and things like that. Before there was nothing. They had to go out to Blaine or to Bellingham. I think that is a very important uh, thing that we have the marina here. Yeah? There's one question that comes to my mind, John, and that is uh, when the Canadian boatmen come down, they have to come across the border, don't they? What kind of procedures are necessary for them to come down? Oh, that is uh, no problem at all. At the moment, they just come in from Canada, and uh, at the fuel dock, we have a telephone, and they can clear in by telephone. So that's no problem at all. When they go out and uh, touch Canadian land, and they come back, then they have to clear again. But when they are just fishing outside, there is no problem at all. I see. So uh, they needn't really worry at all about coming no, in. No, no problem at all. No problem at all. OK. Uh, now, you tell me that the Harbor Master Building is definitely planned uh, for the very near yeah. future yeah. and uh, that uh, it looks as though that that is certainly going to materialize. And uh, what about, uh, say, uh, people who are interested in getting exercise uh, in this, uh, around the marina? There's a trend on now for people to get more bodily exercise jogging and that sort of thing. Is there any way in oh which yeah. the marina can yeah. be of service? Look around, you see, when you see we have a, 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 a track around the whole marina that is for a bicycle and for uh, walking, and uh, even you can use it for horse riding and things like that, then it's not going to be paved. It's going to stay just like it is now, that uh, no traffic, big traffic can go around the marina. They have to take care for the roads or from the parking lot. Yeah. 
I see, so that there will be biking facilities. Uh, what do you foresee in the future uh, when you consider the marina as a totally complete facility? Uh, could you just give us a kind of a, a quick summary word picture? Uh, uh, Barn is going to be a very nice village with uh, nice facilities uh, all around and I'm sure that the people, uh, especially the United States people, will like it here. Then you know the climate here is very good and uh, when they all have all these facilities that, that uh, we intend to build here, then they should be a, a very nice area, resort area. That's what we like to be. I understand that we have about half the rainfall of Vancouver and uh, so that would indicate to me that it's a very ideal place to come as far as uh, uh, the climate is concerned. There's a less rainfall here. And uh, so it appears that we have an ideal situation here at Point Roberts in terms of development, in terms of recreation, and yes, uh, in terms of employment too, yeah, yeah, which I think uh, is an important uh, uh, consideration. You see, till, till now there was nobody actually who was trying to sell uh, Point Roberts to the people. Now we have a chamber of commerce here and they do a lot of good work to promote Point Roberts. And I think that is important too. Yes, I uh, quite agree. It's really been a pleasure to talk to you this morning, uh, John, and we'll be watching this development with great interest. Thank you very much. It was my pleasure, Dick. This is Dick Clark uh, announcing to you who are viewing this uh, program that if you would like to learn more about Point Roberts, be sure to write to me. Just write to Richard E. Clark, Box R, Blaine, Washington, 98230. And I'll be very happy to give you whatever information I can and until next time, same time and same station, this is Dick Clark saying goodbye. South Delta newcomers would like to meet you. They meet the third Tuesday of each month at St. David's Church, 1115 51st A Street. Also, satellite groups meet for lunch, excursions, and so much more. For more information, phone 943-9407. Welcome to a series of programs entitled The History and Social Structure of Point Roberts. This is the last of a series of programs about a small community located away from the mainland of the United States of America, Point Roberts, Washington. Today we will be thinking about the future of this community, but as we look back over this series of programs, we have seen Point Roberts change. We can look back to a time when this area was once richly inhabited by Salish Coast Indians who were engaged in fishing, sockeye salmon. We have seen the time of white settlement going back to about the year 1873 with the arrival of John Harris who became the first permanent settler. We've seen Point Roberts change from a military reserve to a settled community complete with canneries, fish traps, farms, farms engaged in dairy products, gardening. We have seen a diversity of activities at this community. 
Finally, we've seen the community develop as a recreation and retirement area, which brings us more up to the present time at Point Roberts. Today, we are at the Roof House in Point Roberts. We are located on Marine Drive, and I have with me as my guest, my first guest today, uh, Mr. Paul Nielsen. Welcome, Paul. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. It's nice to be back with uh, Delta 10, first of all, because I've been working for you before. And it's also a pleasure to be one of your guests on this program. Uh, what would you like to more or less know about the uh, program? All right, uh, Paul, the first question I'd like to ask you is, uh, you've been here more than two, dec two decades, haven't you? More like 22 years? As a matter of fact, I bought the property from Gus Iverson about 22 years ago, mm -hmm. and I remember I was walking here in my boots, one foot of water, pouring the cement, building the roof, putting in the chimney, wiring, kitchen, and everything. See, it's one big roof. So that's why the name is called the Roof House Art Gallery and Restaurant. Tell me, Paul, what was it like 22 years ago compared to today? Do you see great change? Yes, there has been a, some change. Not as rapidly as I have seen other communities. Actually, we have been a very slow growing community, then it's a question, do we like it or, or don't we like it? I have had a lot of pleasure, and I like Point Robert, and I still like Point Robert. Nice and quiet, if that's what we want. But I can also see that Point Robert could have grown tremendous in the past time. But as you asked me, and I heard you said to the viewer, what is the future of Point Robert? I think that most area, whether it's Point Robert or somewhere else, it can help it. It will grow. And I could see in the future, on the waterfront, all the way around, a white marine drive with houses, hotels, motels, a lot of businesses. I could even see skyscrapers within 25 years. Why not? I've seen it other places. However, it all depends how we plan the future and how the politicians are uh, to uh, play with Point Roberts. Do you see it growing more as a retirement uh, community than anything else in the future then? Retirement, no. Not really. I think it would be foolish to come over here to Point Robert from the mainland. That's my own opinion. And history has shown that there's only very few people moving to Point Robert. Why should they come from Blaine? Why should they come from Seattle and Bellingham where they have doctors and all kind of facilities, big supermarket. They have everything over there. Why should they come here? There's not enough work for young people and for the elder pe people, not enough activity. So we are kind of, as I sometimes say, we are the last potato row, or shall we say, the uh, last frontier. But we could still grow on one condition that we get people in. And how do we get people in? That's the next question. Yes, that is the next question. You are asking me that question. I can. See. Well, we have a big potential market we can draw, uh, draw from. That's Canada. Besides, it's mostly uh, whether they're U.S. citizens living at Point Roberts or residents. Most of them came from Canada. The old As At uh, Icelandic settlers, they came from Canada. So it's mostly inhabited by Canadians. So it's all a matter of the border, if we can get them across the line to settle here, but that's against the law. So perhaps the ground rules eventually may change a bit. 
Well, if you ask me that question too, some years ago, they tried to make Point Roberts an international park. And it sounded good. However, when people looked into the matter and found out that an international park means that they can live here until they disappear, either die out or move, they could not sell the houses to anybody else but the park. If a house burned down, they couldn't rebuild it. So everybody was against it. Actually, that idea, they would take part of Canada, equivalent to Point Robert and Point Robert into the park. So nobody went for the idea. I always thought, instead of having a Point Robert International Park, why not call it an international place where people could live? Buy houses, build houses, and sell houses, and then take equivalent of Canadian soil the whole of Tawasson and Point Roberts, where we could live those places. I understand that we have the border. I also understand we have the customs and immigration. I don't mind the borders. I don't mind the customs. I don't mind paying the duty, because that's part of it. But immigration, that could be eliminated for Point Roberts only. So it could be an international place, not a park, but a place. You've really given us uh, some creative uh, things to think about, uh, Paul, uh, new ways of looking at possibilities for the future. And I really want to thank you for appearing with us today as a, a guest uh, to give us this kind of, uh, of insight uh, concerning the possibilities that might uh, develop. Thanks so much for being with us today. And I'm Paul. very thankful that you came to our little restaurant here and uh, we will have a nice little Danish sandwich or Danish pastry after the show. Thank Thanks. You. you bet. We'll take you up on that, Paul. Thank, Thank you. you very much. For my second guest today, I wish to welcome Mr. Jim Bojo, who is with us. Uh, the topic today has been the future of Point Roberts. Uh, this is the last in the series. And welcome, Jim. Very glad to have you with us. Uh, Tell me, Jim. Good uh, to be here, and I want to congratulate you on a very fine series, Dick, and I'm sure that the people who have been watching this on Delta 10 have enjoyed it very much, and I'm sure that during this segment, you're going to let us know a little bit about how you came to write this book. I think it's a fascinating story. I know about it, and I know some of the things that you went through in order to give birth to this excellent book. But before we get into that, perhaps you have some questions. I'd like to ask you, yes, uh, thank you, Jim. What do you do, Jim, at your Point Roberts? Well, I, uh, I have been in this area for about 16 years. We have been in the Tawasson area, and in Point Roberts, we've owned property for about 10 years. We've developed that property. I've been a Point Roberts watcher for many, many years, and uh, a Point Roberts supporter. And as you know, my wife ran the newspaper here for three years, and uh, we got to know the community very well and the people exceedingly well. The standout things that we will recall From a sociological point of view, Jim, it is an interesting time. Uh, I've observed this. It's a time of uh, interesting transition, and of course, in the future, it's going to be an interesting time historically. I would like to ask you, as a historian, you know, his history teaches us a great deal. We're told to look back at history and learn from it. What can we learn, as far as you're concerned, as a historian, about Point Roberts and the direction it should take? I think we can learn that two people from two, two peoples from two countries can uh, work together, can live together, can learn together, can, if you will, grow together. Yeah. I think Point Roberts uh, 
teaches us this and I've been able to trace this through a long period of time you know when we go back to the days when the boundary was uh, put through it was a time when there were tensions between these two countries but we've seen that all resolved now and we have seen which has always been a very outstanding monument in the thought of uh, both Point Roberts and Canada and the United States. To me, the obelisk is a symbol of harmony. I think that's excellent. And I would like, right at this moment, rather than focus on the future a little bit, I'd like to know a little bit more about how Dick Clark came to write this excellent history of Point Roberts. I understand this has been 10 years in the making. So I'm going to sort of turn the tables on you, as it were, and ask you a few questions. May I do that? Yes, you may. Now, first of all, how did you get the inspiration to write this book? Well, it all goes back to the year 1970, uh, or rather 1967, Jim, when I came down from Canada. You know, I lived in Canada for 12 years. I understand, in yes, I understand you were a preacher. That's right. I was an Anglican priest in, in the Calgary, Calgary Diocese for a number of years, and I left in 1967, decided to study for my master's degree in sociology. I wanted to gain a greater insight into not only the church, but society as a whole. And so uh, there was just a new master's program at Western Washington University in Bellingham then, and uh, I became the first person to ever receive a master's degree in sociology at Western. And Professor George Drake said, since you're going to be first, why don't you write your thesis about a unique subject? And so Point Roberts came to mind. And uh, we had collected data on Point Roberts, and I wrote my master's thesis on Point Roberts. Did George actually think of this, or did you? I think George thought of it first. George had sent me out to collect data for the community association, and I knocked on cover for this, this book. This book was uh, designed by a gentleman by the name of Tom Hovde, and I believe he's a young artist who is just uh, becoming known, and I think that this represents uh, a, a very fine breakthrough for him. I think he did a good job. Quite symbolic, mm -hmm. having the two flags, and you're discussing harmony between the two peoples. I think that that demonstrates it very well. Text Type of Bellingham, I understand, is the publisher. That's and correct. Now, the book is available, I guess, at many of the outlets uh, mm -hmm. around this area. Yes. And I think viewers would be interested in knowing where they can obtain the copies of this book. Oh, yes. Well, so far, you know, uh, we've just started disseminating the book, but it can be uh, bought at uh, Point Roberts at places like uh, Ben's mm -hmm. store and, and uh, at... Uh, uh, at uh, the roof house and uh, also where Eileen is, so, you know. Uh, uh, yes. Well, it used to be the farmhouse. Yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. What I'd like to know, too, uh, it's customary to ask authors uh, if they have sold the movie rights to their books. <laughs> no, we haven't done that, uh, it could, Jim. It could form there the basis are, of an interesting there movie. There are episodes in there that uh, are pretty dramatic when you go back to the early uh, pioneer days in the, yes. in the 1870s. There's some moving drama in there. It gets pretty exciting at well, times. Well, we've seen on, on uh, television uh, Centennial and offshoots from that, uh, which were historical accounts, really, of, of uh, the settlement of the, the West. And uh, there's no reason why this shouldn't turn out to be a, uh, a bestseller and have, movie, uh, have a movie made about it. But anyway, getting back to uh, how you came to, uh, to write this, I understand that during the time that you were doing this book, you were in Alaska, you were teaching the armed forces in such remote areas as uh, King Salmon and places like that? That's right. And That's well, how did you, you have to correspond with various of the people that gave you material for this? And just how did you go about doing it? I corresponded to some degree and uh, took materials with me also and would uh, prepare materials on the side while I was uh, at these remote sites. I also did a lot of my work in between assignments. You know, each assignment was two months long and I did spend only eight months out of the year in Alaska on the average for the past two years until the present year when I became more involved with the book. Mm -hmm. So you see I've given myself time to work on the book. Well in the uh, turning out this book and in, in the great amount of effort that it took 
have you had time to do much else in terms of uh, you know, any hobbies of, uh, of any, any kind? I guess this has been your total, uh, your total time has been devoted to it. Well, I do have a hobby, Jim. What's that? I love to play the piano. Uh, and I, I, I took a bachelor's degree in music uh, many years ago, my first degree at Western in 1952. And I try to keep in shape with the piano, but I don't get to work at it as regularly as I'd like to now. Well, maybe we'll have an opportunity to uh, have you play the piano sometime on, on Channel 10. It would be rather, uh, rather interesting. But what plans do you have uh, to go on in your writing? Now, you've done this history, which took a great deal of time. Um, are you going to do a sequel to this, uh, looking into the future, perhaps? I don't foresee that at the present time, looking into the future. <laughs> now, after uh, having got, gotten to know the people mm -hmm. over here, you live in Blaine. Wouldn't, wouldn't you think now that you, you've gotten to know the area, you love the area, obviously, mm -hmm. it, uh, you're over here a lot. Wouldn't you like to become part of this? In some ways, it was good that I did live uh, uh, away yes, from Yes, away you would be so more objective have, about uh, it. Right, yeah. uh-huh. And uh, it sent me off to other sources, such as archives and uh, mm -hmm. courthouses and places like that. And uh, it draws heavily from those materials. However, I will say that while I'm not prepared to write a sequel to Point Roberts, I am very much interested in other other areas, such as uh, the Peace Arch, for example. Yes. No one has ever written about the uh, Peace Arch. No, it could, uh, it could live, be the subject of yes, an interesting book. I live uh, right there, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, in the area of the, of the, of the Peace Arch or also uh, possibly the history of Blaine. Blaine would be an, an interesting uh, town to, uh, to research for that matter. Uh, I would uh, like now to just sort of recap. I haven't had the opportunity to, because I was out of town on business a lot, to recap what you have done in this series of programs. Uh, uh, you've covered most of the point, I suppose. You've been over it pretty well with uh, the Channel 10 crew, have you not? Mm -hmm. Yes, we have. We have started at the obelisk, and we've literally taken a tour around the community of, of Point Roberts, and over 20 people have been involved in these interviews, uh, which we are concluding today. And uh, not only have we looked at the history, but we've looked at the social organization of Point Roberts. And uh, I think that uh, that is a dimension of Point Roberts that needs to be considered, especially now, at this stage, Why when now? we see when we see developments uh, affecting such topics as the marina. The major developments. Yes, yeah. uh-huh. This is a good time for a sociologist to be studying Point Roberts. Sociology is really my uh, bailiwick more than history. I came to history via or through sociology more than anything you see. So we will see perhaps, and you'd like to study the emerging possibility of incorporation, uh, local government, and perhaps uh, Point Roberts coming to, uh, to grips with a lot of problems that have come, it has inherited down through the years. And among those, of course, uh, we know the, the water problem, the law enforcement problems which they have had over the years. And reading your book, it becomes very uh, clear that the resources have played a major role. The fishing and the farming here were major industries, and logging too at one time. So that uh, we, we now look to a new kind of industry. Tourism uh, would be a major industry which would supply jobs and uh, for the people of the area. So it does present uh, unique opportunities for you. So you may in, in time perhaps consider settling here and watching it very closely. Yes, uh, I will be watching, uh, because it is of sociological uh, interest, uh, uh, Jim. This is true. Now, we're in a setting of, of art and uh, in here at Roof Gallery and the Roof House. It does tell us that uh, one of the things that perhaps should be sharpened is the accent on the arts. You were very, very interested in seeing Point Roberts develop as an art colony, haven't you? I, I am, but remember, I do have a personal interest. I suppose you might say it's Dick Clark's bias. I, I like like music, I like art, uh, I like uh, that which is beautiful. And, uh, well, you can see art right here in the roof house, yes. for that matter. 
And uh, I enjoy seeing that kind of trend in a community of this type. And I think there is a chance that the community will go more in that direction as time unfolds. Well, I think we're getting more and more people here who have uh, talents. And I know of uh, an outstanding graphic artist who's mm -hmm. moved to the area. We have movie writers. Mm -hmm. We we have uh, many artistic people who've moved to the area because they, they enjoy this particular climate, which is rather unique, and all of the amenities. So. I think perhaps uh, your, your predictions that it may become an art center, not unlike Carmel, uh, may come true. Maybe it stands a chance, uh, uh, Jim. Well, I hope you didn't mind me switching roles on you a little bit. But I, I thought I, it was I thought, refreshing. I thought the viewers would enjoy hearing a little bit about you. We didn't have a moment to really touch on uh, the great experiences you've had, and they've been enormous. I think it was refreshing, and I've been very happy to have you with us uh, today, Jim, and I wish to thank you for appearing. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. And I would like to close by saying that if you have any questions that you'd like to ask about Point Roberts, Washington, be sure to write to me. My name is Dick Clark, Box R, Blaine, Washington, 98230. It has been a great joy to be your host in this series of programs. I wish to thank Delta 10 uh, for having me as host. I wish to thank uh, Ron and Gary and Scott and others who have worked with me and who have taught me a lot because, uh, you know, I've never appeared uh, in a series of television programs before, and so it has been a rich educational uh, experience for me. And so, until next time, this is Dick Clark saying goodbye. <laughs> The New Westminster and District YWCA is offering a wide selection of exercise and keep fit programs for women this year. They offer a number of regular fitness and exercise classes, as well as special programs for the working woman. For more information, call Gail Benedet at 526-2485 or visit the Y at 180 6th Street in New Westminster.